Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, thank you so much for joining us uh, here at CSIS uh, for this event to launch uh, a report that came out a few months ago, but it's still counting as a launch, uh, which was our Project Atom 2023 report. Uh, my name is Heather Williams. I'm the director of the Project on Nuclear Issues here uh, at CSIS. Um, and just really thrilled that you're all here today and joined us for this discussion. If you haven't already checked out the Project Adam study, please do so. Um, you can find it on our website. Um, and what this study did um, is uh, it took a competitive strategies approach to one of the overarching strategic challenges that we're all talking about and facing right now, which is how to deter two peer competitors. And for the project, we commissioned uh, five very different, uh, well, six very different experts in the field to write five studies uh, about how to answer that question. And for each one of the studies, um, we asked them to address what will this mean for forced posture, what will this mean for modernization, extended deterrence and assurance, and what will it mean for arms control. And each of our uh, strategists and authors very uh, adeptly and kindly answered the questions and uh, did the homework assignment. And we ended up with what I think is a really special report um, that takes a very complex strategic question and looks at it from really every possible angle. Uh, and then uh, the Pony team at the end, we took all of those different strategies, uh, mushed them together to try to evaluate which arguments did we find the most compelling, and we came up with uh, what we call 10 first principles for deterring two peer competitors. So if you haven't seen the report already, I um, really encourage you to go look at it. Um, but additionally, uh, this event comes uh, somewhat fortuitously only a few weeks after the release of the Strategic Posture Commission. Uh, report, and you'll see on the agenda throughout today, we are um, really lucky to have quite a few of the commissioners joining us, and just a hunch, the Strategic Posture Commission might come up in discussion uh, as well a few times. Um, so we, we have almost, I think we have all the re reports authors um, here today, with one exception, unfortunately, Oriana Spiral Mastro um, couldn't join us. Uh, the time difference was uh, pretty impossible, uh, <laughs> also due to scheduling. Uh, so just a few housekeeping items, uh, and then we will dive right into things. Um, the, but first and foremost, the goal for today, it really is to dive into the substance and the themes in uh, the Project Adam study. And from the, those papers, one theme was cross-cutting in every paper and really came through, and that is the need for flexibility. That flexibility might mean more conventional options more emerging technologies. It might mean more nuclear options. There was disagreement on that point, but flexibility was a really important theme and just providing more options for decision makers. So that's the theme that I really hope we can dive into in today's discussions. Uh, so this event, it will be on the record. Uh, it is being live streamed. Uh, to submit a question, what we're gonna ask you to do is rather than raising your hand, we're actually gonna ask you to use the QR code and you should have this on your seat. I can see it, it's a giant QR code. Um, so uh, it should be easy to find. And then if you just scan that, it'll take you to a Google Doc. It's a really easy system to use. And you'll submit your questions that way. And then the Pony team is gonna get them and they'll bring them up to the moderators. And so this is just really to ensure that we get as many questions and as much conversation as possible during the discussion. Um, so that, that'll be that system. Um, before we begin, I also have to share with you our building safety precautions. We feel very safe in this building um, and in this space, but as a convener, we do have a duty to prepare for any eventuality. Um, in the event that there is some sort of an emergency, I will be your safety officer, and so just follow me should the need arise. Um, but also just ask that you uh, follow any instructions and just familiarize yourself with the exit. So there's exits, uh, I think those are the only exits. So the, at the back is the main exit, if um, for any reason you should need it. Um, with that, we're going to turn it over to our program. And so today we will have three panels. Um, the first panel will be on nuclear flexibility and deterring two peer competitors. Um, second, we will talk about flexibility and credibility with adversaries and allies. And then finally, we will look at what are the obstacles to building in more flexibility. So really diving into that theme. Um, and so with that, we're gonna get started. Very easy transition. Um, for, the, for the first panel, um, I'm thrilled that we have uh, three of the paper authors and Greg Weaver, who was a commentator um, on the papers as well and was a really great advisor throughout the process. Uh, I'm not going to read their full bios, uh, but just for the sake of time, um, but very quickly just to let you know um, a bit about their backgrounds, the order we'll go in. Uh, we'll start with Leonore Tamaro. Leonore is Vice President for Government Relations at J.A. Green & Company. 
She formerly served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Nuclear and Missile Defense Policy in the Office of the Secretary of Defense, and previously worked in the House Armed Services Committee and at the Center for Arms Control and Nonproliferation. I actually did not know that before. It was very exciting. <laughs> um, Greg Weaver is um, Principal of Strategy to Plans LLC. Prior to this, he was Deputy Director for Strategic Stability on the Joint Staff our Joint Chiefs of Staff Directorate for Strategic Plans and Policy, where he was responsible for the formulation of joint staff positions and recommendations on strategic deterrence and nuclear policy, among a variety of other things. Um, next, we will hear from John Wolfstall, who is the somewhat new um, Director of Global Risk at the Federation of American Scientists. Congratulations. Um, and an adjunct senior fellow at the Center for New American Security, CNAS. Um, from 2014 to 2017, he served as special assistant to former U.S. President Barack Obama, a senior director for arms control and nonproliferation on the National Security Council. And then lastly, we will hear from Frank Miller, who is a senior advisor um, to the International Security Program here at CSIS. Frank served from January 2001 to March 2005 as a special assistant to President George W. Bush and is Senior Director for Defense Policy and Arms Control on the National Security Council staff. And just reading through these bios, I'm really excited and really impressed that we got you all here uh, and that we got you all to contribute to Project Atom. And so uh, we're going to go through all the speakers. Um, you can start using the QR code at any point. You don't have to wait until we open it up for a discussion. And so if you do want to get questions in, then just remember to, do, um, to use that functioning. So with that, Leonor, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Heather, um, and thank you very much for the opportunity to be part of this um, really great project, uh, and I think really prescient um, and insightful in terms of um, you know, how we deal and go forward uh, with new threats and, and this new um, security environment um, where we're facing uh, two nuclear peers, uh, much more aggressive adversaries, um, and it was a pleasure uh, uh, being on this project with um, uh, John and Frank as well, uh, and working with Greg. Um, so I'm going to talk about, this panel is about uh, flexibility um, with regard to our nuclear arsenal. Um, and so I'm going to talk about flexibility in um, a more open-ended uh, concept. Um, we're looking at and facing new threats, um, and these really require a new focus um, and evaluating and broadening our concepts of deterrence. Um, and so flex being flexible doesn't mean, um, in my opinion, it doesn't mean new types or an increased number of nuclear weapons. I think this is too narrow a construct for the kinds of threats um, that we're facing uh, going into the future. Um, and it really misses, um, it, you know, it's an important debate and a debate that's going on in Washington, in Congress, uh, with the administration, certainly. Um, but I think it's too narrow a construct if we just focus on that piece of flexibility. Um, so we're certainly seeing, let me talk about the new risks we're seeing um, and why we need a broader concept of flexibility. Uh, and then I will talk about the importance of resilience and survivability. Uh, and then third, I'll talk about uh, the new domains um, and the importance of innovation to strategic deterrence. So let me talk about this concept of flexibility. Um, we are seeing uh, China uh, and Russia make very significant uh, uh, leaps in nuclear modernization, investing in novel systems. Um, China looking at um, uh, having nuclear weapons on alert and having launch on warning capability. Um, and more focused on the concept of escalate to de-escalate, which we talked about in the context of Russia. Um, and so we need more flexibility in our strategic deterrent in terms of um, having more decision space um, and not having our adversaries force our action uh, to either be, be um, forced into a corner where we're either gonna give up early in a conflict um, or be forced to use and resort and increase um, our reliance on nuclear weapons, um, or be forced up the escalation ladder uh, into all-out nuclear war. And so what we need to do is uh, ensure that we aren't boxed in, um, and that we have options, and that we're buying time for the president, um, for senior military leaders. 
Um, and to do this, we need to make sure that we increase resilience and survivability uh, in our strategic architectures, um, including in our nuclear architectures. Uh, and for this reason, you know, I support looking at uh, making um, our ICBMs mobile. Uh, it's part of looking at what does an architecture that's going to last uh, into the 2070s, 2080s look like, and not being shackled by 20th century architectures and decisions that were made in the 1960s when we're facing new threats when technology has advanced. Uh, it also means um, investing in resilient and survivable space architectures that support uh, nuclear deterrence. For example, um, the Department of Defense has uh, begun uh, to invest billions of dollars in terms of um, uh, de developing and deploying a more resilient missile warning, missile tracking um, constellation, um, where we're going from a handful of satellites to smaller, uh, much more numerous um, uh, satellites um, that will increase our resilience and survivability uh, against um, an early attack uh, uh, by our adversaries and will decre decrease our vulnerability. Um, and we also need to apply this concept of resilience and survivability to our nuclear command and control system. And I think this area um, certainly needs a lot more focus. Um, but it's not just about uh, nuclear capabilities or uh, space-based capabilities that enable our nuclear enterprise. Um, it's also about increasing our conventional readiness uh, and non-nuclear capabilities. And uh, we should certainly explore this as part of the uh, Strategic Posture Commission. Um, that just uh, was released uh, on October 12th. Um, and as part of our recommendations in the commission, um, increasing our level and our readiness in terms of conventional forces, being able and ready to fight two conventional conflicts, um, also means raising the threshold um, for uh, denying uh, easy attacks by our adversaries. For example, we also recommended um, uh, missile defense um, to defend critical infrastructure and critical nodes um, to defend against what might be coercive attacks, um, a limited uh, but coercive attack against the United States. And so we need to ensure that our adversaries uh, aren't able or tempted uh, in a crisis or early in a conflict to inflict uh, crippling damage. Um, or attacks uh, that would undermine uh, the American will. So it's really about um, buying time um, and buying maneuverability and buying options uh, to limit the threat of inadvertent or rapid escalation. <coughs> and so third, let me talk about the importance of new domains, um, cyber and space particularly. We're seeing new threats that could very significantly complicate strategic deterrence in those domains. Um, let me talk a little bit about uh, the importance of data. Um, we just saw this week, uh, there was an article that Duke University was able to buy the personal information, um, phone numbers, names, uh, addresses, uh, family uh, data um, of 50,000 active service personnel. And so we need to think about um, how data that's owned by the private sector um, and, and the vulnerability and availability of that data can impact strategic deterrence. Um, and uh, we need to think about uh, new tools um, and resilience against uh, new, serve, new attack vectors that our adversaries may use. Um, and for example, uh, Heather Williams just uh, published a book uh, with Sir Lawrence Friedman um, looking at the uh, impact of the digital environment um, on uh, crises and conflicts. And so we need more, a uh, better understanding of how these new threats can impact strategic <clears throat> deterrence. Um, Mark Andreessen uh, from A16Z said software is eating the world. And so we need to ask ourselves, um, would software have an appetite for strategic systems, including nuclear systems? Um, so we need to look at what this means in terms of um, deterring, uh, increasing deterrence earlier in a crisis or conflict. And to do this, we need to avail ourselves of new tools. Uh, we need to be able to uh, leverage emerging technologies 
including cyberspace uh, AI, um, to increase uh, the quality of information and have better information faster to the president and to our senior decision makers. And we need to uh, leverage innovation. A lot of these innovative technologies are in the private sector. And we need to um, ensure that our defense enterprise is correctly leveraging these new tools. We need to not be locked into outdated technologies uh, and architectures. And to do this, we need to look at our uh, acquisition processes. We need to make sure that we can um, pivot from you know, outdated acquisition processes uh, that were developed in the 20th century where you know, it took 10 years to deploy new systems. Um, that needs to radically change um, or at least have complementary uh, acquisition processes that enable us to leverage private sector innovation that changes every six months um, and be able to uh, harness that for defense. Um, so, let me stop there. Again, we need to broaden our concept of flexibility, our concepts of deterrence, um, better understand the new threats facing our strategic systems, uh, and invest and leverage new tools. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leonor, and thank you for sticking to time, since we do have a full panel, and I'm sure it's going to be a lot of discussion questions. So with that, Greg, over to you, and thank you so much for doing this. No, no problem. Thank you, Heather, for asking me. Um, and I do encourage everyone to read uh, the Project Adam report. I think it's a, a really good product. Um, so I was asked to address three questions about the need for a more flexible nuclear force. The first question was, what are the arguments for a more flexible nuclear force? The second was, what does more flexibility look like? And the third was, what are the implications of such a force for U.S. strategy, force posture, and doctrine? So let me try to quickly walk through those in 10 minutes. Uh, I think there are three main arguments for why we need a more flexible nuclear force than the one currently planned in the program of record uh, modernization program. The first is, I think, a more flexible force is necessary to deter limited nuclear use and in the process of uh, improving deterrence against of limited nuclear use, also enhancing the deterrence of conventional aggression because adversaries who don't believe they have an option to escalate their way out of failed conventional aggression are less likely to start a conventional war in the first place. Uh, the reason I think a more flexible force is necessary to deter limited nuclear use uh, is that I think we need credible, flexible response options to do two main things. The first is be able to respond to limited nuclear use in a way that's designed to restore deterrence by convincing an adversary that they have miscalculated about how we would respond in a dire way uh, and that they, we are going to deny them their objectives and they're going to pay a price that exceeds any benefit they can achieve. And second, that we need to be able to counter the military impact of adversary limited nuclear use in a theater conflict. Those two things I think are crit critically important to being able to deter limited nuclear use, particularly by Russia. Uh, and probably in the future by China, depending on how their strategy evolves. Uh, the second reason I think we need a more uh, flexible nuclear force than currently planned is that we need to be able to respond effectively to limited nuclear use while minimizing escalation risk. And that, in my opinion, requires a range of response options that have two main uh, attributes. First, they can't, the adversary can't preemptively negate those options or, or deny us those options. And two, the adversary can't defensively defeat those options. Um, and then the third reason uh, I think we need a more flexible nuclear force is we need the credible ability to use nuclear weapons first to compensate for conventional inferiority in a two-theater future conflict against two nuclear peers. And there's one caveat associated with that requirement. If the US and its allies can build and field a conventional force that can incredibly win two simultaneous conflicts against Russia and China. That's obviously the preferred option to increasing reliance on nuclear weapons uh, in a second theater. Uh, I'm skeptical about whether we and our allies can or will do that, and that's why I think it's important to think about the need for a more flexible force to be able to fill this role if it's necessary. Uh, and the other reason, the. For, for that purpose, for compensating for conventional inferiority in a second theater, 
we need to keep in mind that our nuclear forces that would play that role, we could be, we may have to use them in a situation where adversary air and missile defenses have yet to be degraded. And that requires a different kind of set of capabilities, I believe, than what we have today, what we have planned today. Um, and then to put all three of those reasons or arguments for a more flexible nuclear force in context, let me just quickly walk through what I think the planned force lacks that the more flexible force needs to provide. Uh, in my view, um, we don't have sufficient theater nuclear forces in Europe for those roles. Uh, our dual capable aircraft that are there now, I think, are necessary, but they're not sufficient. They're vulnerable to a preemptive attack uh, with a fairly limited Russian strike, and it's unclear if allies will sanction the use of American nuclear weapons from their territory in a future conflict. And that's, a, that's an uncertainty that I think the Russians uh, would be likely to try to exploit. Uh, the second thing the planned force lacks is any theater forces whatsoever in Asia. And in a future two-peer environment, the idea of deploying NATO DCA, dual capable aircraft, to Asia is kind of, I think, a strategic non-starter. It, it just tempts Russian opportunistic aggression in Europe if, if we were to stick with that approach. Um, the third reason, uh, the third thing the planned force lacks is survivable ways to augment NATO, NATO theater forces with low yield options beyond the W76-2. Uh, I think the W76-2 is necessary, but it isn't sufficient to meet the increased flexibility requirements. I'd prefer to have options that don't involve uh, strategic ballistic missile launch warning. Um, fourth, I think operationally relevant delivery capability is lacking if the dual capable aircraft in, U uh, in Europe are either lost or ineffective. Um, and so I think effective theater options that would really provide a more flexible nuclear force have sort of the following attributes. They need to be continuously forward deployed. They need to be survivable day to day without force generation. They need to be able to reliably penetrate unattrited adversary theater air and missile defense. They need to be able to provide the president a range of explosive yield options, and they need to be able to put weapons on target on operationally relevant timelines. So let me talk now a little bit about the answer to the second question, what does more flexibility look like? Um, I think a more flexible force would have these attributes, an increased range of employment options, an increased range of explosive yield, uh, enhanced survivability in the, in the force, both pre-launch survivability and post-launch survivability, post-launch otherwise known as penetrability, uh, the ability to deliver weapons on an operationally uh, relevant timeline, and we can talk more about that and answer to questions if necessary. Um, an enhanced presence of U.S. nuclear forces in theater, particularly in Asia, uh, an enhanced ability in the total U.S. nuclear force to hedge against technical or geopolitical change, um, and then a reduced need to either generate forces to achieve survivability or to rely on launch under attack for survivability in the context of silo-based ICBMs. And so the systems that I think could provide the kind of enhanced flexibility those those attributes um, would require uh, include a sea launch nuclear cruise missile, theater range ballistic missiles, either sea or ground based, uh, mobile ICBMs, as Leonore recommended. I think that's a good idea. Uh, and probably uh, just as important, if not more important, is improved theater nuclear command and control, improved ability to uh, uh, command theater nuclear forces in, a, in an operationally relevant way. Uh, still under the control of the President of the United States, obviously. And then finally, the third question was, what are the implications of this force for U.S. strategy, force, posture, and doctrine? So with all due respect, Heather, I think that's the wrong question. <laughs> strategy and doctrine should drive force requirements and not the other way around. Uh, and in a, um, So let me say this. Enhanced force flexibility let me turn it around a little bit. Enhanced force flexibility will better enable current U.S. strategy and doctrine in a future two-peer environment in the following ways. First, it'll enhance deterrence of conventional aggression and nuclear escalation, in my view. Second, it would enhance the insurance of our allies and partners, which is really important. It's important to deterrence, and it's also important to nonproliferation. 
Third, it would provide an effective counter to adversary use of nuclear weapons against us and our allies. Fourth, it would provide an effective counter to adversary conventional superiority in a second theater war if we can't field a, a conventional force sufficient to fight and win in two theaters. And finally, it would improve our ability to hedge, and this is, this is pretty important, during the force modernization transition that we're going to be going through in the 30s, where um, the timelines associated with the arrival of new capabilities and the aging out of old capabilities is looking more and more tenuous. Um, that, that was fantastic, really rich. Thank you so much, Greg. Um, uh, John, over to you. Great. Um, so the only thing we agree on is that we think Heather ran a fantastic project <laughs> and that her team ran a fantastic project and we all think that the product is really valuable and very rich. Um, and I know I disappointed Heather because actually during the meetings Frank and I agreed a lot more than at least I expected to. Um, so I was on good behavior. And then um, I thought I was too. I thought we did well. I, I was, I, we modeled good behavior, Frank. Let's not, let's not stop. Um, and I also want to say thanks to Greg. Greg, um, I actually asked if he would critique my paper. We work together in government. Um, he always helped make my arguments better. I never won, but he always helped strengthen and improve and clarify them. And I think we would all agree, I'll go out on a limb here and say that we all need to be doing better to improve the facts and the details and the clarity of what we're actually proposing and why. Because in this new period, Nobody really knows what's going on. Nobody really knows what's going to happen. And so that gets to your first point about flexibility, right? We are making decisions now that we're going to be living with for 50 years at least. And the world is going to look very different in 50 years, probably much more different than the difference between 50 years ago and today. And so I think there's a lot of desire for flexibility. And it took Heather and 35 years of me living in Washington to actually get around to supporting acquisition reform. So thanks for that. That's really been helpful. Um, so uh, I, I broke down uh, my presentation on three basic points. The last one gets to flexibility, and but sort of echoes my paper, which is the first on deterrence, the second on what role arms control plays in here, because I think that's part of a flexibility strategy, and then also the question about hardware options. So the first on deterrence, um, where I think we can continue to get better, um, and that's putting it mildly, is on not believing our own narratives when it comes to deterrence and really trying to understand better exactly how our behavior affects our adversary and how our adversary's behaviors are actually intended as opposed to what we perceive. Right? We talked a lot about this and very early on we agreed deterrence is, you know, you, the adversary gets a vote and you need to understand why and what are we actually trying to signal. And 70 years after the bilateral nuclear relationship was established, we're still really bad at this. Um, we were just in Europe, uh, uh, Greg and I, at a conference with some Europeans and there were some very profound disagreements on exactly what Vladimir Putin has been saying and doing with nuclear weapons throughout the entire conflict in Ukraine. I don't know that they're right and we're wrong, but the fact that allies who speak the same language, who are immersed in this, still have disagreements about this, suggests to me that we're not digging in deeply enough to really understand the dynamics. And I'll give you an example. Actually, uh, yeah, I'll give you an example on this. Um, I've talked to a lot of people about how Russia has effectively used the threat of nuclear weapons use in Ukraine to prevent the United States from putting troops on the ground in the conflict. Right? That sort of seems to be a fairly well accepted norm. I, I have worked a little bit, and I don't mean to overplay this, I've worked a little bit for the current president when he was vice president, so I have a tiny insight to his views. I don't think he ever had any intention or desire to put US troops on the ground in Ukraine. So we're tracking correlation, not causation. I'm not saying that deterrence doesn't work, I'm not saying that Putin may not have tried to use it, but we're so convinced of that narrative that we may not really understand what lessons countries are taking away from the conflict, and if we don't understand it, we can't accurately determine what sort of forces we need, whether there's a deterrence gap or not. I tend not to be as convinced of the deterrence gap argument as others, but I'm agnostic in the sense that I don't think we have a very good uh, in-depth research and understanding about this, in part because um, the decision-making process in both Russia and in China is incredibly insular. Um, I think there's better but not exquisite intelligence on this inside the government. Um, and so I just worry that we're not as good at it when it comes to Russia, and I'm particularly concerned that we lack the skills and capabilities to truly understand this in the China context. 
And if you see the political dynamics about the threat that China poses, both the pacing threat, its capabilities, the worries about opportunistic aggression or collusion with Russia, we're, we're tending to buy the headline and the narrative, and I keep looking to see if we really have the underlying fact base to support that, and I'm left wanting. So I'm not coming out and saying that's wrong, I'm just saying we should be a little bit more agnostic about how that looks. Um, last bit on deterrence, particularly China. I do worry when we get to this question about force modernization and flexibility and additional assets. Um, I mean, this is, going, this is and will continue to be a military confrontation, but we need to avoid replicating US-Soviet targeting assumptions when it comes to what it takes to deter China. China is not the Soviet Union. One of the reasons we targeted nuclear forces in the Soviet Union is because the only thing we knew how to track. We didn't understand what was going on in the Soviet Union. We didn't understand Soviet leader decision making. We didn't have enough information about how their system operated and what we wanted to hold at risk to impose punishment. And so it became a numerical calculation about destroying forces. I don't believe that China cares as much about nuclear forces as the Soviet Union did in the 1950s and 60s and 70s. I could be wrong, but it, the fact that they've waited so long to engage in a forced modernization and that they have so many other things that affect their ability to control their own state, to remain in power, to control the region beyond nuclear, suggests that we, want to, we may have options other than the straight numerical targeting of nuclear forces for deterrence. Reassurance is a totally different issue. We'll talk about that later. Damage limitation and war fighting is a totally different issue. We'll talk about that later. But in terms of the calculation of deterrence, the numerical game, I think, is a little different than it's being portrayed in the literature. So that's one piece. Arms control. Um, Greg just talked before about how strategy, strategy should drive force structure. That's exactly right. It doesn't always work that way. In fact, it almost never works that way. I'm also a firm believer that strategy should inform arms control policy, right? When critics or people who are skeptical of the role of arms control come out and say we shouldn't do arms control for arms control sake, I was like, exactly right. Know what you want to achieve, look at what your assets and your capabilities are, and see whether arms control can play a role in achieving some of those tactical or strategic objectives, whatever those may be. I'm a big fan of decision time, right, warning. Those are things that we recognize have value that arms controls can do because of transparency. It may be able to help you in some other associated means. Um, and in locking in normative behavior, I think it still has great value. That's aside from the process of engagement and dialogue and confidence building. But also, we shouldn't do nuclear deployments for their own sake. We're trying to achieve a goal. And that's where I think we have to do a much better job of integrating the two communities. And even now, we'll set up here, and we have worked on these issues, and a number of you have as well, but the arms control community outside government is very isolated from the operators and the deterrence thinkers. Inside government, there's a very, very small and somewhat disconnected community from the deterrence and operators. And Unfortunately, a lot of the government capabilities on deterrence and force structure and operations has also dwindled, particularly in OSD and the State Department. So we really need to do a much better job of recognizing that gap uh, and rebuilding in a better way, although I think there are actually a lot better collaborations in parts of the 60s and 70s and 80s uh, than, we, than we see today, and we need to sort of get over that. Okay, last thing on, on hardware and flexibility. So um, again, you know, the joke about acquisition reform notwithstanding, these things are unbelievably slow, right? I mean, the Obama administration inherited some initial ideas uh, as part of the forced modernization in 2009, which went into the New START negotiating uh, agreement and the Senate um, uh, resolution of uh, adoption uh, in 2010. Um, and those ideas had been already around for a while, and here we are more than 10 years later, and we're really just getting to bending metal and prototypes, right? And a number of these programs are gonna be delayed. I remember being pretty heavily criticized in 2012, 2014, when Jeff Lewis and I wrote that not only are these things are incredibly expensive, but that we're going to see partial disarmament by default because the throughput is not great enough to handle three simultaneous modernization programs. And I think we're sort of seeing that borne out in some of the cost escalation project delay. So we need to get better at this. And I think flexibility can help us here, right? So one of the ideas that we put forward for flexibility, and I'm thrilled to hear you think now, mobile ICBMs are I've worth looking into. That. That's not true. I have the paper to prove.
at that time. <laughs> um, in, in part because it was, it was in the debate about whether we were actually going to go forward with the ICBM program of record at the time. So it was one of the reasons we, we sort of disagreed on, on the process. But you can do a smaller number of ICBMs with more warheads than is currently planned. And that gives you some flexibility in terms of upload. It may give you some flexibility in terms of the industrial plant. Remember, the reason that we supported single, ICB, single warhead ICBMs was twofold. One, we wanted to avoid tempting targets in the United States, but we were trying to shape Russian decision making about their ICBM force. And that ship has sailed. They are going back into heavy ICBMs again for multiple reasons. And as long as we are convinced that we can manage the stability problem of first strike um, resiliency and having retaliatory second strike capabilities and redundancies, it's not clear to me that we need to lock in 400 ICBMs with single warheads. We can d debate that, but I also think that we have some opportunities in terms of the numbers there. Then there are questions about mobiles and what it takes to actually go mobile. That's more, continues to be more of a political argument in my view than an infrastructure argument, but you have to get both right if you're gonna go in that direction. Now, I come at it from being a skeptic on ICBMs generally, so that informs my view, and I think you need to recognize when people have these different opinions, that generally informs um, uh, you know, the background here. But the other piece that really, um, I think, informs it more than anything else is the new technology. And I think Leonor's points in terms of what points of vulnerability we have that we need to be addressing in terms of space, cyber, command and control. I love the idea of theater command and control as well as you know, national command and control resiliency because those points of vulnerability to me are greater than the nuclear force structure points of vulnerability. And when you look at the dollars that are being spent, we tend to go for the big metal pending programs and less towards the infrastructure and capability. And that's true on um, uh, warhead production, um, and material as well. And so um, the investment and the added dollar, in my view, should be going towards these other new capabilities, particularly when you look at the questions of where the next vulnerabilities are going to be. So I hesitate to say, cut the ICBM and just build more subs, because there are reasonable worries about what AI and underwater drones are going to do in terms of our ability to have safe bastions for submarines. And maybe that argues instead of having more large submarines, for having more smaller submarines so that the cross section for each one is less of a tempting target and they have to deploy more search and destroy capabilities in order to get the same payoff. Again, I don't know what the answer there is, but if you look at the projection on our computing capacity, on the ability to do machine generated learning, autonomy, and these new capabilities, we have this ongoing um, uh, fluidity and the decisions we're making now were actually made 10 years ago, and I, I just think that their, uh, their persistence is, or their, their continuing value is gonna be increasingly in question. And that is if you just do that in an isolated way, separate from what it actually takes to deter and influence adversaries. That's just in the force structure piece, and I think the last point I'll make is just a second, Leonor's first one, which is just talking about nuclear, in the nuclear box is important because we all want to be important and we want to have this influence on things we care about, but it is increasingly disconnected from all of these other fields and all of these other um, technological developments that the Strategic Posture Commission, I think, tried to get at, but that we need to do a much better job as a community and as a country, um, long-standing evergreen statement, right? We always need to do better, this is not new, um, but because things are moving so fast, um, we need to accelerate in order just to keep up. So I'll leave it there. Great, thank you, John. Um, and in the course of discussion, I realize you're all also getting a little bit of a flavor of the dynamics of our project out of meetings when folks would present their papers, we would get into these sort of discussions. Um, and so, but before we open it up to you all, um, last set of remarks, uh, over to you, Frank. Thank you, Heather. Uh, a British friend of mine likes to say that everything's been said, but not everybody said it. Um, so I'll try to depart from the script a I bit. I right here on my note card. Well, there you go. <laughs> Um, so what I want to start with talking about is, is flexibility and, and why, why do we need flexibility? For, for what reason would we require flexibility? And it's because we now face new circumstances. We face two nuclear peer threats. Uh, we require an urgent shift in our focus from sort of focusing on, on one with the other as a lesser included case to two 
threats that are of equal concern and that we need to deter Russia and China simultaneously. John is right. We can't tell what might happen. No one could tell that Hitler and Stalin, sworn enemies, were going to sign a pact in 1941. No one can predict the future. And whether future aggression, which we hope to forestall, is planned or opportunistic, we have to guard against that, particularly because if you cast back historically, we no longer have the defense industrial base that we used to, to build up during World War II and that we built up during uh, the Cold War. So what does this require us to do? What do we have to do? We have to have the capability to threaten appropriate responses and thereby to deter potential aggression from Xi Jinping or um, Vladimir Putin. And this requires the capability to hold at risk what enemy leaders value. This has been vetted through the IC for four or five decades. I'm going to disagree with John, so I'm going to break that first thing. Um, we, the, we need to hold at risk what enemy leader values. I'll say it again, it's themselves, it's the support structure that keeps them in place, it's their military forces, their war supporting industry. And I will say that having run U.S. nuclear targeting policy from 1985 to 2001, we did not focus solely and exclusively on Russian Soviet nuclear forces. It was a much richer discussion. Um, also, you've read some of the, the recent articles about shifting what we target to hold at risk. The most recent one being by James Acton a few days ago, with which I fundamentally disagree. And we can talk about that in the Q&A if you want to. But we also have to worry about space and cyber as well. And when we talk about our current force, which needs to be more flexible, we need to talk about that force holistically. And that's not only nuclear weapons, it's conventional weapons. It is cyber, it is space. It's the gray area where we continue to lose every day because we lost the capabilities we had in the Cold War. And it's infrastructure. It's the infrastructure that undergirds our defense industrial base, and it's the infrastructure that undergirds our nuclear weapons production capability, which is yellow tending red. So we need to make certain that where we currently lack credible response options, we need to build those, not only to deter potential aggressors, but to reassure, to reassure our allies. And I'm not going to say much more on that because the next panel is going to delve into that topic in, in, in more detail. So what does that mean? It means that, that our investment in our nuclear forces now is modest. The, the Strategic Posture Commission's recommendations for investing in the nuclear forces are almost exclusively when the modernization program ends, which is to say in the late 2030s and the 2040s. Um, there, is one, there is one exception, and that's the exception that um, Greg so, so clearly laid out, and that is uh, I believe we need a slick amend. That was not the commission's view, but I believe we need a slick amend. We can talk about that. The commission talked about the need to invest now in tanker aircraft, in prompt conventional strike. I don't care if we have 500 ships or 1,000 ships, if they can't close in the theater of operations because of Chinese or Russian anti-axis area denial capabilities. It doesn't matter. So we have a capability of a prompt conventional strike system which has been languishing in a joint Army-Navy program, and that needs to be accelerated. And we need to start thinking, and this is something else that the Commission talked about, in integrated air and missile defense for the first time, we need to come up with a defense that will block coercive, that is small scale, Russian or Chinese attacks to give the President more flexibility so that the President doesn't have to respond immediately with, with a nuclear strike. And the whole purpose, again, is to give the President of the United States more options to deny the enemy any appearance of an exploitable gap. So, to turn to the questions that were asked of us, were the implications for strategy and doctrine of having more flexibility? None. None. What we need to do is simply flesh out the capabilities to carry out our current strategy. Uh, and I want to talk for a moment about doctrine. People throw the word doctrine around as if it means something. I'm going to tell you, doctrine doesn't mean anything. If you go out and read whatever the joint pub is. In the United States. 
No, no, let me finish. <laughs> What's the joint pub? The, the joint pub is whatever. There's a mm -hmm. joint, joint, joint staff publication on nuclear doctrine. If you think by reading that you're going to tell what a president of the United States is going to do with nuclear weapons in a crisis, you're completely wrong. And in a similar sense, I get what the Russian military may practice and what the Chinese military may hide and practice. That does not give you a good insight into what the leadership's going to do in an existential moment when doing something might in fact result in the destruction near or, or, or total of their homelands. So that's the first thing. Implications for a nuclear force structure are modest. The Slickham N, I believe, because it matches all the capabilities and characteristics that Greg put forward, and I don't need to enlarge upon, is a critical element of our deterrent. And anybody who wants to talk in the Q&A about how this is going to hamper submarine operations, I'm happy to gain, uh, to, to, to enter that discussion too. Anybody here own two nuclear weapons in their life? I did, on a ship, okay? We could talk about that. Um, we need to improve the infrastructure. What Leonor was talking about, the valley of death is killing us every year. If you think about the Polaris program, we went in five years from the idea of a missile carrying submarine to its first deployment. The U-2 was conceived and deployed in one year. We can't do that today, and that's on us. That's not, that's not anybody else's problem. We do need to think about missile defense, as I said, in a whole new way. We need to, we need to accelerate tankers and conventional prompt strike. And then let me close out a little bit off script by talking about three misconceptions with, with regard to the Strategic Posture Commission's report. The first is that the Posture Commission calls for massive new investment in nuclear weapons. That is completely false. If you look at what the Posture Commission says, it says the modernization program at its end needs to be extended. More Columbia submarines, more B-21 bombers, more LRSO. Nothing in the near term, in the far term, okay? Second thing is that it calls for a new nuclear arms race. John said it. We have not yet put a new system in the field. Russia and China have been putting new systems in the field for the past 15 years or five to eight years, depending on, on the country. The late Ash Carter in 2017, after he left the Pentagon, said, yes, there is a nuclear arms race. It's between Russia and China. The United States has not yet entered into it. So that's a second falsehood about false characterization of the Strategic Posture Commission. And the third is that the Strategic Posture Commission is calling for a massive increase in US nuclear forces to reach the level of the old British Navy standard of having as many nuclear weapons as the next two enemies or next two leading nuclear powers combined. It's completely false. You cannot find that in the report. And indeed, just on my own part, if you read my project ad and paper, I make that clear. We need to have enough nuclear weapons to do what we think we need to do, and no more. If the Russians and Chinese want to make the, rush, the, the rubble bounce, bad on them. But that's not, not something that we have to do. So when you look at and talk about the strategic posture report, read it. Don't read the critiques, which are completely false. And that puts me at 9 minutes and 18 seconds. So. <laughs> Thank, um, thank you, Frank. Thank you all for being very disciplined um, in time and for making this really productive. Um, there, we have really fantastic questions coming from the group, but before doing that, I'm going to take a little bit of a risk here. Um, and first, I'm going to open it up to all four of you um, based on the discussions that we had in Project Adam. I think we had some really um, got into a lot of the detail. And so first, I want to see if any of you want to ask a question of your fellow panelists um, or want to make any follow-on points. Um, Leonor, I'll start with you. Anything? Um, can I? I'll just make a comment, and I think it reflects the consensus of the Strategic Posture Commission report that there's actually a lot of agreement among um, you know experts who have tended to disagree on you know narrow issues, right? Like so, slick amend, for example, to me is a sort of a narrow issue, um, but I think on the broad concepts. Um, there is a lot of consensus and bipartisan consensus um, 
you know, from deterrence experts, which I, you know, think is very encouraging, given that we're uh, in a security environment where threats are very significantly increasing. We're um, not just in size, right, but as I said, in types of threats and um, and facing adversaries that might be more inclined to coerce the United States and its allies. Um, so because we're at a new inflection point, I think it's actually uh, very encouraging that um, there is so much agreement on uh, the need to prevent a conventional war from even starting and to uh, reduce the risk of inadvertent and rapid escalation um, as you know the best solution to avoid um, the risk of a nuclear war. <coughs> so we'll get there. Anybody I, else want to I just had one question for John because I don't know what paper you're referring oh, to. I'm just, I'm but just okay. <laughs> okay. So just for the record, I've supported mobile ICBM since 1983. So. We are in violent agreement <laughs> about something. And I, I'll have to blame somebody exciting. else for why we didn't get to pursue it. Um, I, I have a question actually for both it. for both Frank and Greg. You could take it or not. It's I get not with you. I get frustrated when people talk about a deterrence gap when I'm not sure that's exactly what they mean, and that often what I think we're looking at is sort of a, a, a frustrating ability to dissuade competition based on our capabilities. And so I wonder whether you think that, that I'm going to invite you to say, yeah, that's just flat wrong, right? I mean, how much of this is, in your mind, deterrence gap versus we're trying to maintain stability and dissuade competition and aggression and, and um, provocation, and it may be that nuclear weapons are just not all that great at that. Is that? Yeah, so, so I'm in favor of preventing all those things you just said, <laughs> and I don't like the term gap. The reason I don't like the term gap from a deterrence perspective is we don't know where the adversary's threshold is, and they probably don't know right now, right? They'll know it in the moment. My concern about our planned modernization and our planned force is that I think in the context of Russian strategy and Russian capabilities and in the context of what we see coming from the Chinese and the likely changes in their strategy that that reflects because they are quintupling their nuclear force. They obviously have changed their view of the need for nuclear weapons in their overarching strategy, and there's nothing we've done to cause that, because we haven't changed what we were going to do since 2010. So, so and, and all we were going to do is replace the current force we have with, a, with new systems. So why the change in, in China's perception of the need for a nuclear force on a par with the United States? So my concern from a deterrence perspective is the force we are building wasn't designed for the environment we're now know or are pretty confident we're going to be in. And we need to take a new look at it. We've done that, I've done that. We did that in government and we need to take a hard look at what's gonna be required. And my biggest concern, I don't think there's, I don't think there's a big concern today at the strategic homeland to homeland level, that deterrence relationship is extremely robust, right? My concern is that both of these, one or the other of these adversaries could perceive the need and the ability to initiate limited nuclear use to either coerce us or defeat our conventional forces because we don't have sufficient response options to convince them that we're serious about deterrence at that level beyond threatening uncontrolled escalation, which isn't a credible threat. The President of the United States is not going to commit suicide in response by launching a large-scale nuclear attack on the Russian homeland in response to the use of three nuclear weapons on the battlefield. So we need, we need if you want to call it a gap, you can. I don't really, I don't like gap because gap implies you know exactly how much deterrent capability you need and you never know that, right? But I don't think limited nuclear use by an adversary is where the United States should take risk. It's so cheap to, to provide a more flexible capability that would enhance deterrence of that, that it's just a crazy place to take risk. So let me say, whatever papers you've got back to 1983, I, I don't think I've ever used the term deterrent gap. Okay. Certainly not in the no. last couple and of decades. I wasn't saying no, 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 no. Second, let me endorse everything that Greg said. 
um, except to amend it to say we haven't changed what we've been doing since since the late 1970s, you know? And, and along the way, in the past couple of decades, we kept telling ourselves, you know, if we, if, if, if we could only talk to the Russians and Chinese and we could teach them how to do nuclear deterrence and, and, and nuclear forces the right way, we could teach them that they don't need MIRVED ICBMs. We could teach them to follow our lead, in you know, a classic, follow our lead, and draw down their theater forces, nuclear forces, which they agreed to and then went way back up. Um, we could show that we had restraint in our force structure and that we haven't put new systems in the field and surely the Chinese aren't going to quintuple their force, but they have. So r the Chinese and Russian leaderships, for their own reasons, have built their forces and built their, their policies in ways that we weren't going. And what we need to do is ensure that in a crisis that neither Xi Jinping nor Vladimir Putin says there's a, there's a weakness there and we can exploit that weakness. You know, whether it's in space where we, you know, space was going to be pristine. Good luck with that. Um, whether it's in space or in cyber or with conventional forces, we are reacting, I would argue, to what's going on in the world and developments within Russia and China, some of which we understand and some of which we don't. So I don't think there is a deterrent gap, but I think that if we continue not to modernize the force, which as you point out is aging out, uh, there will be at some point a deterrent gap. If we do not have a, a credible capability to respond to Russian or Chinese theater nuclear capability, there will be at some point a deterrent gap. But I think that's where, where Greg and I are. But I'm not, you know, I'm not running around talking about a deterrent gap. So, um, no. yes. We you, can get to another question. Uh, well, I you, can talk about the, it. the question for you might get to this. So, um, I, because it, there are some really fantastic questions coming in, so I do want to get to them. Um, so we're going to do this in batches. So first batch is going to be for Leonor and Greg, and then don't worry, guys, I've got a batch for you too. Um, so I've got one question. The first question is for both Leonor and Greg, and then I have one um, specific for each of you. So first um, question for both of you. This follows on very nicely, I think, from uh, Frank's point in this discussion. Um, how do you respond to the idea that your recommendations for flexibility could prompt Russia and China to just respond in kind? So how, what would your response to that be? Um, and then question for Leonor. Uh, could you please elaborate on the concept of new nuclear technology in terms of flexibility? And then question for Greg, uh, autonomy was not on your list of attributes for systems needed for enhanced deterrence. Is tailored autonomy necessary? So I'm not sure what autonomy means in that context. It's just autonomy and question marks. So I'm... Um, Can we ask the questioner? I mean, you're not talking about, you're not talking about autonomous clarify. systems. Are you talking about the unilateral U.S. ability? I'm sorry. Say that again. Okay. So are you talking about the unilateral U.S. ability to use nuclear weapons versus an alliance decision to use nuclear weapons? Okay. All right, I'll so try. Autonomy can mean whatever you want it to I'll try. <laughs> I'll try that. Uh, so, uh, Leonor, over to you first. So that first question, how would you respond Thanks. to concerns that any of your recommendations might just force Russian China or prompt Russia and China um, to, to respond in kind? And if you want to elaborate on the concept of new nuclear technology. Yeah. Um, so I think respond in kind, um, not exactly sure what the question is getting at, but what, I'm, what I've been advocating for is that we need to prioritize survivability uh, and resilience um, and uh, provide more options to military leaders and to the president um, that don't force the use of nuclear weapons in response to an action by our adversary um, and don't force rapid escalation. So I think, you know, if our adversary is responding kind, that's great. I think more resilience on all sides, more stable architectures um, on both sides, um, I, I think is helpful. Um, you know, I, in terms of, um, I think the responding kind, right, and that gets a little bit to the previous discussion um, on uh, adversaries using low-yield nuclear weapons and um, 
the United States having to have enough options to be able to respond in kind in that scenario, uh, I, I think is a um, false dichotomy. This is not apples to apples, right? I think if an adversary is going to use a low yield nuclear weapon, it's going to be in the context of losing a conventional war and being backed into a corner. Um, it's not because they don't believe the United States doesn't have you know, X number of nuclear options to be able to respond in a limited way. Um, so that might be a difference in terms of um, you know, how we see the threat and how we see solutions to the new threat of either China or Russia using one or a few low yield uh, nuclear weapons on the battlefield. Um, but, but I think it comes back to we need to have the resilience um, and the survivability to increase deterrence by denial. So to convince the adversaries that they aren't going to achieve either their political or military uh, aims and not going to derive any benefit by uh, resorting to or crossing that threshold um, and using nuclear weapons. And if, if that deterrence fails and they do uh, use low yield nuclear weapons, I think we need to uh, increase the options um, uh, for the president to not force a rapid escalation to either respond in kind or get into uh, you know, a limited nuclear war, which I don't think we can control. I think escalation is uncontrollable at that point. Um, and so um, uh, that's, you know, that's, that's where I think we need to be able to take a punch um, and again, not be forced into uh, um, responding in kind with nuclear weapons. Did you want to say anything on the new oh, on the, on new, the technology? new technology? Yeah. Um, so I think it was uh, you know what do I mean about n new technologies and flexibility? Um, so I th I'll give uh, an example of um, new technology enabling resilience. Um, so you know the uh, transition to much smaller. Um, uh, satellites, uh, the transition to cheap launch and access to space, uh, I think are, are uh, an example um, of how advances in technology uh, are going to enable increased resilience. So again, um, pivoting from the focus on you know billion dollar uh, exquisite um, handful of satellites uh, which uh, are extremely vulnerable now, and um, more than vulnerable, they're destabilizing because they might invite an attack early in a conflict, um, and by me, might be lead to misinterpretation that it's a precursor um, to a nuclear strike. Um, so, so those two advances in technologies, um, you know, smaller satellites and cheaper uh, access to space, is going to allow us to. Um, you know, have proliferated mm -hmm. satellites, uh, and again, more resilient. We're able uh, to deny benefits uh, to the adversary, to convince the adversary not to attack at all. But if the ad adversary does attack, um, that we're able, again, to take that punch and survive uh, and not be crippled. I think another um, quick example is ubiquitous um, uh, space imagery. Um, that's very significantly increasing transparency. And again, that's a double-edged sword. Um, but you've got uh, incredible advances in the commercial sector on um, electro-optical infrared Im imagery, but also on synthetic aperture radar that sees through clouds, that can image at night. Um, and, um, and so having increased transparency early in a crisis um, or early in a conflict will avoid uh, you know, surprises in the fog of war uh, that might, again, lead to rapid escalation or, mm -hmm. um, you know, mm -hmm. leading military leaders or the president feeling boxed in uh, and that they need to take rapid action um, uh, given, you know, new information that wasn't expected. Really helpful examples. Thanks. Uh, Greg, uh, over to you. Yeah. So, uh, so Frank has, he gave a good, I think, three-part list of the things about the reaction to the Posture Commission that he likes least. Uh, the one I like least is this idea that somehow the United States taking action to adjust its force structure and force posture in response to ongoing changes in Russian and, new and Chinese nuclear posture and strategy is somehow initiating an arms race. 
Okay, we are not initiating an arms race. So the fear that if we field Slickerman, for example, I'll just use one of the examples, um, that somehow the Russians and Chinese will respond in kind. Well, the China, Russians already have fielded Slickerman. They have it. They send submarines carrying that weapon off the east and west coast of the United States, right? and pose potential decapitation threat to the American nuclear command and control system. So there's no response in kind to this that's going to make the Russian theater nuclear threat worse than it already is. Okay? The Russian theater nuclear threat is massive. It's in every arm of their conventional force embedded in their navy, in their air force, in their ground forces. I, I have never advocated that we need to match what the Russians have in theater forces because our strategy doesn't call for what Russia's strategy calls for with theater nuclear forces. But I do need, think we need to augment our capability for all the reasons um, that I said. Um, and then, um, so look, I'm not worried. And the, uh, let me, I didn't say anything about China there. China is already building a much larger, much more flexible theater nuclear force than they've ever had as well. They're doing that, okay? And they now have ballistic missile accuracies and cruise missile accuracies that enable them to have low yield warheads. They didn't used to have low yield warheads because their missiles weren't accurate enough to make them effective. Now they are. Uh, and, they're, and they're equipping those, those missiles with nuclear warheads. Uh, and expanding both the range of options they have available and the numbers of those weapons that they have available. Um, on this, I think I understand what you mean by autonomy. I, I think I did address the role of autonomy. I didn't make it a specific attribute, but in describing, for example, why Slickamen is a useful augmentation to dual capable aircraft in Europe, it's not dependent on an, on an American ally agreeing to launch a nuclear weapon from their territory against Russia. It's an independent, unilateral U.S. decision to do that. Uh, and that enhances deterrence. I think NATO having a nuclear sharing arrangement is an important part of the alliance's deterrence posture, but I don't think we should rely solely on it. We never have in the past. The U.S. has always had unilateral response options. Um, and so I think, I think there is something to having a theater nuclear capability that isn't fully dependent on 31 allies agreeing on its use. I think that answered it. I'm not yeah. sure. Did that get to what you were after? If it didn't, you guys will have to okay. discuss in the break. <laughs> so um, we're, we're, um, we have eight, according to the agenda, we have eight minutes left. We're going to go over a little bit because there's so many questions. If you do want to ask a question and you haven't put it in yet, do so right now. Um, and then Lachlan will bring up one last batch. Um, so we've got a question for John and then a question for Frank. And then we will just only be, able to be able to take one or two last questions. And I apologize if we're not going to get to all of them. But those are wonderful things to have conversations about over coffee um, or lunch later. So question for John. Um, how can we draw chi um, China towards arms control and increase transparency? Um, and so in light of that, any reflections on uh, yesterday's, yesterday's meeting? Uh, and then to Frank, somebody took the bait and said, what are your reasons for disagreement with James Acton's recent ar article? So um, That's a plan. I'm, 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 I'm glad <laughs> that it's actually James Acton who's calling it. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm glad that came in. But John, over to you first. And if you could try to keep it to like three minutes. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll be brief. Um, so um, I don't know how you draw China in to arms control. Um, but you have to keep trying to draw China in on arms control. And um, you know, in my interactions with people in the government, I have found pretty common, historically repetitive arguments about, well, we shouldn't reward their behavior by negotiating with them. Um, we should make them feel as unsettled as they're making us feel. That will show them the downsides of their strategy, and then they'll want to talk with us. Um, we should uh, increase some things that can threaten China and that will draw them to the negotiating table. And um, my sense historically is that those arguments tend not to work. Uh, leaders who are much more worried about escalation dynamics and controlling conflict are much more eager to try to find ways to engage both for the process because you learn a lot about your adversary by what do they want to talk about, how do they respond, what do they not want to talk about. And um, we do want not just to educate them, because I think there are a lot of smart Chinese who understand this, but we're trying to figure out how we can triangulate the Chinese bureaucracy 
um, China is not a monolith, and there are different views inside China, to try to find where are we going to engage those parts that I, might actually be willing to say, all right, we're going to compete with each other to the nth degree, but maybe we don't want to blow each other up. Or maybe the people that are more risk averse can actually work with us to try to find ways that we can create some conduits for communication in a crisis that's automatic and doesn't require somebody to pick up the phone. Like I had to explain to somebody the other day that one of the great things about the Nuclear Risk Reduction Center is nobody has to pick up the phone, it just prints out, right? So there's no action needed. So I, you have to keep trying and you have to keep hitting your head against the wall. One thing I will say, however, is it also takes a recognition, like my mother used to say, that it takes two. The idea that China's acting and we haven't been involved in this, to me, doesn't understand the broader sense of how China's behaving. And I'm not sure that I'm right, but I know that China is taking actions that they believe are necessary to secure their environment to their advantage. Why do they think that? Why do they think that they can move to a nuclear force of about 1,000 to 1,500 strategic offensive nuclear weapons? In part, it's possible that that's because that's what the United States and Russia have deployed and refused to go below. So the idea that they're just acting to me, this is part of the problem. I'm not saying they're right and we're wrong. I'm an American, I happen to think we, we're trying to keep the world safe for the order that benefits us. But we have to recognize that there is a dynamic going on and that we're part of it. Frank, if you could, three minutes. Yeah, so I'm gonna quote from the 1983 Scowcroft Report. No, no, I didn't write this, but, but if you want to understand deterrence, this is, this is the most fundamental way, I quote. Deterrence is not and cannot be bluff. In order for deterrence to be effective, we must not merely have weapons. We must be perceived to be able and prepared, if necessary, to use them effectively against the key elements of an enemy's power. Deterrence is not an abstract notion amenable to simple quantification. Still less is it a mirror of what would deter ourselves. Deterrence is the set of beliefs in the minds of enemy leaders, given their own values and attitudes about our capabilities and our will. It requires us to determine as best we can what would deter them from considering aggression, even in a crisis, not to determine what would deter us. And James Acton's argument, unless, and I don't mean to mischaracterize it, was we ought to stop targeting leadership and, and nuclear forces in Russia and China because that's destabilizing. It would cause them to, to, uh, to, to target our leadership and nuclear forces. And we should focus on conventional military and war supporting industry. And I think, and this is not an ad hominem comment, James makes two fundamental mistakes there. He, he substitutes his judgment for that of Xi Jinping and, and uh, Vladimir Putin. They clearly value their ability to stay in control. And what we want them to think is that if they start an act of major aggression, they're not gonna be around to have the fruits of whatever the post-war world is. Harold Brown in 1980 said, we know that we cannot win a nuclear war. We need to make certain that the Soviet leadership understands that and accepts that as well. And so you project forward, we're talking about making sure that Vladimir Putin, who is an autocrat and a dictator, and Xi Jinping, who is an autocrat and a dictator, understand that aggression is not going to provide them a better world. And so it is. The leadership is what keeps them in power. It's their military, the key elements of their military power and their war supporting industry. That is critical. Second, the notion that Chinese forces or Russian forces are targeted at our command and control and our nuclear forces only because they believe we do the, the same to them is ludicrous. It's, it's a sense of, 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 of simply um, misunderstanding their culture. The whole point is they do what they do because they think it's right for them, right? They're, they're going to target what they think is right for them, not what, what they are doing in reaction to our targeting. And so the logic, there is no logic in his argument because he violates the fundamental rules of that quote from the Scowcroft Commission. Heather is drafting the email for James to come and have a... Right, debate. fine, do the debates. Yeah. Early, early 2024. Um, <laughs> mark your calendars. Um, so we, we got, again, I really am sorry, we're not going to get to all questions. We had some fantastic questions about specific capabilities, um, about strategic conventional hypersonics, strategic high yield systems, targeting, what do you think of um, proliferation among allies, 
But in the last batch, yeah, we got yeah. a great question that I think every one of you um, is extremely well suited to address. You will have one minute to answer this question <laughs> each, and uh, we're going to do it in reverse order. So I'm going to start with Frank. Uh, the question, given the considerable cost of modernizing both conventional and nuclear forces, how would you persuade Congress to allocate those funds? First of all, a war is more expensive than, than modernizing the forces. Second, the modernization that we're talking about, again, I stress, it's long-range conventional strike, it's tanker aircraft, it's doing some sort of missile defense for the homeland, and the nuclear stuff is in the out years. It is modest. We didn't cost it out on the Strategic Posture Commission because it wasn't our job. We didn't have that capability. But if you read the Posture Commission report, the add-ons that we're talking about are modest, with the potential exception of the defense industrial base and the NNSA industrial base. That's a different matter. John? Um, I don't know the answer to that question because I've tried and it hasn't worked. Um, I think the president and uh, the Pentagon um, want to provide um, leadership with good options. It's clear across a range of issues that we don't have them. And I always point to the cluster munition um, uh, decision that the president had no option but to provide cluster munitions, which we've been trying to work against being used because we didn't have the defense industrial base in order to provide regular 155 artillery shells. That is, you know, but we've been spending $50 billion a year on nuclear. And so that suggests to me that there's a misallocation of resources because we are gearing up in different domains for the nth degree threat as opposed to addressing the capabilities that we're actually going to need in the field. That's not an argument to get rid of nuclear weapons. That's not an argument to not do modernization. It's just a recognition that they're finite resources. They're always finite resources, even in this environment, um, and that the defense budget, which continues to grow, approaching now $900 plus billion dollars a year, in my view, is not politically sustainable. Great. Uh, so I'm going to focus my answer to this question on um, cost of nuclear modernization and augmenting nuclear modernization. So look, there is one, only one, existential military threat to the United States. That is a large-scale nuclear attack on our country. It's the only existential threat to the United States posed by an adversary military. That, in my opinion, and in the opinion of the last several Secretaries of Defense and Chairmen of the Joint Chiefs as well, makes Nuclear deterrence, the highest priority mission of the Department of Defense in the American military. It's obvious, okay? So, and Jim Mattis, you know, I'm a Democrat, but Jim Mattis said a really important thing early in the Trump administration. He said, you know, the, the United States can afford survival. And that's the only survival threat to the country. You can argue about how much of it you need, but I don't think you can argue that it's the highest military priority in uh, American defense spending. At the peak of our modernization program, the current planned modernization program, the nuclear forces, both operating and maintaining the existing force and the additional cost of modernizing them, will reach a little under 7% of and the defense the budget. that's on the 2018 budget. A little under, yeah, on the 2018, a little under 7% of the budget, okay? That means we're spending 93% of our defense spending on lower priorities than the highest priority mission in the, in the nation. So I don't think changing that seven to eight, which would be a big increase, bigger than what I think anybody is calling for, um, is an inordinate change in allocation of resources within the defense budget given the relative priority of the different mission sets. And, and that, one last thing on this, I said I'd limit myself to nuclear, but I, now I won't. So, <laughs> so 93% of the budget is spent on everything else at the peak of the modernization cost, okay? That inherently tells you that conventional forces are far more expensive than nuclear forces. And, chain, and building a conventional force able to fight and defeat Russia and China simultaneously is going to cost way more than an additional 7% of the current or the 2018 defense budget to build that kind of force. So, you know, I'd love to build a force capable of doing that and not have to increase reliance on nuclear weapons. I don't think that is probably something Congress will support, but I do think Congress will support judicious and prudent 
additions to the nuclear modernization program. And Slickaman, as an example, would be the single least expensive element of the nuclear modernization program. That's it. Nice to sneak that in at the end. Uh, Leonore, you spent a lot of time on the Hill, so how would, how would you approach this? Um, if you can, just <clears throat> one minute, we're up against the time a little. Yes. Um, so I would prioritize uh, resilience and additional nuclear command and control um, layers. I think that's probably one of the areas that everybody always says they agree with, um, but then when it comes to funding, um, you know, it's never at the top of the list. Um, so I would say NC3 um, making nuclear more survivable instead of incremental changes on the margin of outdated architectures. So, you know, looking at mobile missiles, uh, ICBMs, I think it's, um, again, you know, it's going to be expensive, uh, but, but it's worth uh, considering uh, to increase strategic stability um, if we're going to keep uh, that leg of the triad. Um, and agree with Frank, we need to make very significant increases in our conventional um, forces and our readiness uh, in order to be able to fight potentially two concurrent uh, conventional conflicts um, and to avoid the risk that we'll need to resort to using nuclear weapons uh, if, if we're not um, able to continue our conflict uh, with conventional means. Um, but just very quickly in the last 20 seconds, I would say probably the most important change um, that's, it's not funding related. Uh, it's changing the culture within the Department of Defense, being able to, um, as John said, it's acquisition reform, being able to um, have much more rapid acquisition, a rapid um, uh, processes to leverage innovation, um, and to pivot to using commercial and leveraging commercial technologies, which in many cases uh, is more low cost. Um, so, uh, so making that change, uh, getting, you know, breaking through the stovepipes, so not just having nuclear, sort of in the nuclear bucket, cyber in the cyber bucket, space in the space bucket, that you need a lot, uh, you know, a broader view uh, within the Department of Defense about strategic deterrence. Um, and so it's really that culture um, and outlook change that's not necessarily funding related. Great, um, thank you. Uh, Thank you to all four of you. This was a really fantastic discussion. And like the Project Adam meetings we had, I was surprised by the amount of agreement and consensus, um, but also thought we had really great discussion and got into a lot of the issues. So, um, uh, and thank you all for your really fantastic questions. Again, I apologize if we didn't get to yours, um, but hopefully it gives a lot of um, fodder for follow-on. But please join me in thanking great panelists. I agree with you. Joe Biden never had uh, so we, we're going to take a 10-minute break, so please be back right. here at uh, 1037, mm -hmm. and don't worry, people will come around to round you up. <laughs>
Uh, my name is Kathleen McInnes. I am the director of the Smart Women, Smart Power Initiative here at CSIS, and I'm a senior fellow in the International Security Program. And way back in the day, I was the coordinator for the project on nuclear issues. So it is wonderful to be coming home and rejoining this conversation and seeing some old, very dear old friends. Um, this panel, uh, as part of the you know, Project Atom, is about credible nuclear flexibility with adversaries and allies. And I can't think of two people who are, um, whose experience and thoughts on the matters are, are two better people to help us think through these dimensions of uh, nuclear posture and the different options that, that the project puts forward. Um, First, Elaine Bunn. Um, she is a non-resident senior fellow at the Royal United Services Institute in London, a member of the Nuclear Deterrence External Advisory Board at Sandia National Labs, and is a senior advisor to the Project on Nuclear Issues here at CSIS. Um, she served as a Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for uh, Nuclear and Missile Defense Policy from 2013 to 2017. And prior to being appointed to DASDI, uh, uh, Elaine was a distinguished research fellow in the Center for Strategic Research at NDU, National Defense University's Institute for National Strategic Studies, where she headed up a project on future strategic concepts. And before that, she was a senior executive in the Office of the Secretary of Defense and also has the distinction of being one of the kindest mentors for so many people and women in this field. So it's wonderful to have you here. At Rob Super, it's a delight to have you joining us as well. He's a senior fellow in the forward defense practice of the Atlantic Council Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security, where he leads its nuclear strategy project. And he's also an adjunct professor at Georgetown University Center for Security Studies, who's teaching courses on nuclear strategy, missile defense, and arms control. He serves as a consultant for Sandia, Los Alamos, and Lawrence Livermore National Labs, as well as the Institute for Defense Analyses. Uh, Rob was a Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Nuclear and Missile Defense Policy from April 2017 to January 2021. Again, <laughs> so, so present in this field and have, have been educating and teaching so many. So thank you so much for, for joining us. Uh, so we're here to talk about credible nuclear flexibility with adversaries and allies. And so there's two simple questions the questions are always simple. The answers are always extremely complex. Um, but the two questions to start off our discussions that I'm going to invite Elaine and Rob to comment on, um, is the first one is how would more nuclear, uh, excuse me, how would more nuclear options impact U.S. credibility with adversaries and related? The flip side of the coin, how would more nuclear options impact U.S. credibility with allies? And so to start us off, I'd like to go to Lane first and then to Rob, um, 10, 15 minutes of remarks, uh, and then we will open up the questions to the audience. Um, you guys know how to send your questions to the agonculator, and then um, it's going to come up. <laughs> Lachlan's going to bring up the questions to me. Um, and so uh, we'll just keep the conversation going that way, and then we will be breaking for lunch around 11.45. So. We're in for a terrific discussion. Great. Elaine, over to you. Thanks, thanks, Kathleen. Uh, and thanks to CSIS for taking on this, this project um, when we are at this inflection point in strategery. Um, <laughs> it's a very technical term. <laughs> yes, no, I, it, I love it because mm -hmm. it, it incorporates all those things that everybody thinks may be impact or part of the strategic calculation. Mm -hmm. um, let me say up front that I've worked with all the folks who wrote the alternative strategy papers, and I have a lot of respect for every one of them. Um, we've been asked to address, as Kathleen said, uh, nuclear flexibility and credibility with adversaries and allies. Um, I do take Leonor's point about uh, the fact that there's more to strategy than just nuclear, um, but since we've been asked to focus on nuclear, that's what I'm gonna do. A good student. Um, with adversaries, I think we shouldn't be afraid to admit that we really don't know for sure what deters. Uh, we, we can listen to what they say, we can watch what they do, we can read all the intelligence reports, we can reason our way through how they might be thinking, we can identify our assumptions, 
and make our best judgment based on those things. Our, our best judgment for the time based on those things. Um, but, but I think we do need to have a little bit of humility about being too certain that we know. And that's another reason, I think, for flexibility. And that's another reason for doing alternative strategies and getting a range of views on these things. Um, I will tell you my assumption about credibility with adversaries. Uh, if adversaries don't believe we'd actually use nuclear weapons under some circumstances, then they don't really deter. Um, whether they believe that or not depends on a lot of factors, including their perceptions and presumptions about the US and historical precedents and that sort of thing. Uh, there's what we've done or not. Um, I vividly recall uh, some track one and a half US-China dialogues in years past uh, where we would hear from retired uh, Chinese generals and admirals, we have studied your history. You did not use nuclear weapons in the Korean War. You did not use them in the Vietnam War. We don't believe you'd use them. And we heard it enough over multiple meetings that, uh, that a US admiral, um, one who is not known as a China basher, um, this admiral was, was um, finally erupted and said, don't be so damn sure you know what we would do. Um, just kind of took them aback, but I, I still worry that maybe um, some believe, based on our history, that, that we would not. Um, adversary perceptions include what we've said, too. Um, they hear us talk about being self-deterred. Uh, adversaries probably hear the president say he doesn't want to start World War III, and they may not get the nuance that John rightly pointed out, uh, that that was about putting U.S. troops over or in Ukraine. Um, they read about TTXs, where we respond to nuclear use uh, with conventional options. Um, adversaries hear our concerns, which are legitimate in my view, about escalation. Um, they hear it a lot, so do allies. In fact, I had one ally put it to me that um, the U.S. talks so much about escalation and their concerns about it that we're worried you wouldn't respond at all. Um, adversaries know that uh, we consider nuclear weapons to be covered by the laws of armed conflict. Uh, we say so in unclassified uh, reports to Congress on nuclear, nuclear employment guidance. And we, in 2013 and in 2020, we said that. And we say it in the Department of Defense uh, Laws of War Manual. Um, so adversaries know that we apply the, the concepts of military necessity, um, you know. Um, you, you don't use additional damage on an enemy that does not further the military objective and, they, and whatever the importance of the objective is. Uh, they know that it includes concepts of distinction between civilian and combatant. They know it includes proportionality. Uh, um, they know that it includes uh, prohibition against unnecessary suffering. So um, because we adhere, and I'm glad we do, to those principles, um, it, is, it may mean, ironically, that a US weapon, nuclear weapon, that is seen by an adversary as more usable may be more deterring. Um, I recently reread uh, the, the 2020 uh, report to Congress on nuclear weapons employment strategy. And as much as I disagreed, disagree with President Trump, former President Trump, um, I, uh, I have to turn to Rob and say that that report was pretty damn good. <laughs> uh, and I'm going to quote a couple of sentences out of it. Um, the United States cannot rely on adversaries to perceive threats of large-scale nuclear responses as credible in all situations. Therefore, to strengthen the credibility of U.S. nuclear deterrence and extended deterrence, the United States will continue to field a range of nuclear and non-nuclear capabilities that provide U.S. leadership with options that can be tailored to deter potential adversaries. You heard a lot about this in the first panel, too. Um, 
U.S. strategies and capabilities need to convey the cost of aggression to the right officials at the right time through the right communication channels in an incredible and convincing manner. Um, and that, that reasoning uh, that, that goes to, you know, we lack nuclear capabilities, um, perhaps ones that meet the, the distinction, proportionality, prohibition on unnecessary um, suffering concepts, um, the fact that, that adversaries perceive that, uh, uh, particularly uh, in our, our ability to respond to limited nuclear use, um, that may also apply to allies. Um, our allies have, you know, it's not like we have to teach our allies these things. Our allies have excellent analysts and strategists, uh, so it's not as though they don't understand that extended nuclear deterrence, deterring their adversaries, are trying to deter their adversaries from the extreme situations, requires flexibility and weapons that an adversary believes the U.S. might uh, actually use in an ally's defense. Um, but you know, I, I seldom hear at allies who are focused on the specific weapon systems or characteristics uh, in their concerns about our credibility. Um, yes, depending on the ally, um, visibility and presence uh, seems to be important to some of them. Lack of visibility <laughs> and presence seems to be important to, to some of the others. Uh, for example, um, Korea, South Korea has, has pushed for strategic assets in their region. This has been going on for a decade or more. Um, the Washington Declaration promise of an SSBN visit to a port that actually happened in July when the USS Tennessee pulled into Busan. Um, that was designed to address that, that visibility and presence issue, at least for now. Um, but then other allies prefer lower visibility. Um, and perhaps that applies to Japan. Uh, I would say that some NATO allies, including some DCA nations, um, really want to keep it low vis. Um, <coughs> thus the need for flexibility, because allies aren't all the same. <laughs> they aren't all the same. And what assures one ally may scare another. Um, so I'm not sure that there's any single nuclear weapon system that meets all the criteria. Others, you've heard others lay out criteria for what we need. Um, is that one system? <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure it is. Um, even more often with, with even more allies, I hear much more discussion about the reliability of the U.S. Not about our capability, but, but about the reliability of the U.S. Will we be there for them in a crisis in any and every U.S. administration? Um, will we again have a president who, not the administration, and not a lot of administration officials, the documents you guys put out were great, but a president who says publicly things like, uh, you know, uh, allies, are too much of a burden, they're not in our interest, uh, they let them get their own nuclear weapons. Uh, uh, it's very transactional terms about financial burden. Um, they worry about that. I was asking Seoul, two weeks ago I was in Seoul uh, speaking, and I was asked whether the Washington Declaration uh, could survive a return of a President Trump. And I had to try to answer that on camera in front of oh, a thousand of my newest friends. <laughs> Uh, that was pretty uncomfortable, pretty <laughs> uncomfortable. Um, but the real question, will, will a drift toward isolationism um, of some Americans and some politicians, will it gather more steam or not? So that, I think that's the real question. Uh, and I'm not sure that any uh, new or modified nuclear weapons capability can fix that. Um, I mean, yes, modernizing nuclear forces and the infrastructure and showing that we're adaptable and flexible will show allies and adversaries that we, we take seriously our responsibilities in a still nuclear world. Um, so then, you know, yes, program of record, uh, W76-2 and the B-6113 that was just announced, what, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but how much that assuages um, allied concerns 
about our willingness to bear the risks, the big risk for our allies, I'm not sure. Uh, it's more about showing we have a stake in our allies' security, that we have a big stake in, in their security. Uh, Russia and China, you know, they, they, they talk a lot about how they see their stakes in their neighborhood. And I think they think, um, again, listening to what they say, reading intelligence, thinking, trying to reason it through, I think they think that their stakes are bigger than ours, especially in their neighborhoods. Um, so how do we show that our stakes are high? And, and there's just no one and done way to do that. There's no, gosh, I wish we could just deploy something and that would just say, oh, see, our stakes are big. Um, I, I do believe that the relationship matters more than the stuff. Um, constancy in, in meetings and statements at all levels, from the lowest to the, to the presidential, uh, talking about the value of allies, which a lot of us have forgotten how to talk about. Mm -hmm. You know, why do, we, why do we extend deterrence anyway? Why do we care about our allies? Mm -hmm. And um, I think the previous generation knew in their guts that they came out of World War II. And I'm not sure that ours and the next one can articulate that very well anymore. Mm -hmm. And we, we need to get better at that. Um, we, um, we also need the, the, the deploying conventional forces, that, that presence in the region and so forth. Um, we, we also hear from our allies, especially in Northeast Asia, more about having a role in nuclear decision making, comparable to what their perception of NATO arrangements are. Mm -hmm. um, that's why I, I think the most important part of the Yun Biden summit and the Washington Declaration, I think the most important part that hasn't gotten that much press was um, when the president said the U.S. would make every effort to consult with the ROK about any potential use of nuclear weapons on the Korean Peninsula. Um, the rest of it, you know, the nuclear consultative group, um, whose name sounds a lot like the nuclear planning group, <laughs> uh, which we all know does policy, not really target planning, um, and the additional tabletop exercises and the mill-to-mill -mill planning and all that, those are implementation steps, I think, in the the commitment to consult. Um, and, and with that Washington Declaration um, commitment, South Korea now has the same commitment as NATO does. I mean, substantively, it's the same. And I think Japan, which doesn't yet have a Washington Declaration-like uh, commitment, I think that will, that will come as well. Um, but, but okay, those are, those are what I think is really important, uh, the things I think are really important. So we've been asked, uh, though, uh, about nuclear force decisions that in, what, what might do what I was talking about, increase our stakes in the eyes of adversaries and allies. Uh, what type of U.S. nuclear force gives an ally a role and a responsibility in nuclear deterrence or use? I hear a lot about how the arrangements in NATO, uh, Greg, Greg addressed this, and he's right. He's right that you want another option besides one that you are relying on an ally to deliver. But what that does do may not be the most survivable. We're working on ways to make that more survivable um, and make that more flexible. What it does do is say to an adversary, we and our ally are in this together they have a role and responsibility, a direct role and responsibility in, in nuclear delivery. Um, they can veto, yes, they can veto using their particular DCA to do that, and yes, it takes our president's authorization to deliver that, but, but it's, a, it's a very direct role. There are other ways that allies can have a role, a less direct role. I mean, there's the conventional support to nuclear operations, what used to be called SNOCAT is now called CISNO, I guess, I don't know how you pronounce the acronym, Conventional Support to Nuclear Operations. Um, and, and you can do that. Um, and they can host you know, all kinds of nuclear seminars and meetings and that sort of thing. But that's not a role in actually delivering nuclear weapons. So um, I would love to hear other options that, that, have, that, that have that characteristic um, in perception of allies and adversaries about um, allies' role and responsibility and our stakes in their security. Um, so um, in some ways, the adversary deterrence questions may be easier 
than the allied assurance issues, but even even the easier one is a, is an educated judgment call, mm -hmm. and uh, and not a certainty. So, with that cheery news, I will stop. Well, thank you for that. Uh, one of the the things that sort of sprung to mind as you were speaking is essentially how do we ensure our allies have agency? You know, mm -hmm. that they're not. Extended deterrence is an active strategy that we we implement together, not mm -hmm. just sort of dictate upon out. And it's a really interesting set of questions. Mm -hmm. Rob, over to you. Thanks. Uh, I, I'm really sure there's nothing left to say, but let me just make uh, three <laughs> three basic points. Calling on Audible here. So uh, Pavlov of Pavlov Dogs fame once said that if you want a a, a new idea, read an old book. Okay, and so this issue of credibility and options and how, what deters, we've gone through this before. This isn't our first rodeo, right? We did this during the Cold War. There's um, uh, uh, a basic formula for deterrence credibility, right? You have to have the capabilities and the will to employ those capabilities. And as my colleagues have pointed out, uh, the, the credibility of that will, the, the resolve to use it, it has to be um, reflected in the mind of the adversary, right? Whatever you're threatening has to be credible. And uh, Robert McNamara said back in the 1960s, you cannot fashion a credible deterrent out of an incredible action. Right? You can't fashion a credible deterrent out of an incredible action. What you are, what you are threatening has to be perceived as being um, uh, credible in the sense that, 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 that you have the capabilities to execute it. Uh, that you have enough stake at play, that you're, that you're willing to execute it, and that you're willing to run the risks, right? Because there's, there's, there's a vulnerability uh, involved. So again, back to history. In 1963, Charles de Gaulle said famously, no one in America can say if, where, how, or to what extent American nuclear weapons would be employed to defend Europe. Okay, so in the, in the early 60s, our allies were starting to get worried that the United States would be willing to run risks Right, to, uh, in the sense of using nuclear weapons to defend NATO. Because at this point, essentially, uh, the Soviet Union was a peer, a nuclear peer at this point. And was it credible that we would, we would initiate a process that would lead to a uh, nuclear escalation that would ultimately um, uh, lead to the destruction of U.S. society? So they were really questioning uh, the credibility of U.S. security assurances. So it took uh, the United States <clears throat> another four years to convince its NATO allies how to solve that problem. It was a strategy of flexible response that was uh, agreed to by the NATO um, alliance. And flexible response, as you remember, was sort of a combination of conven strong conventional forces, theater nuclear forces, as well as strategic nuclear forces to present a continuum uh, 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 of threat to the ally. And remember how we did this, right? We, we actually deployed, in, in addition to strong conventional forces, I think up to about 7,000 tactical nuclear weapons in Western Europe. This is the capabilities, right, that enhance the credibility of our commitment. All right? That's important for you to take away because today we don't have those capabilities, right, certainly not in the, in the Pacific, and we have much smaller capabilities now in NATO. That's the key point. And the question is whether or not uh, we have sufficient forces uh, in order to convince the adversary that we are willing to run risks on behalf of our allies. So what, what keeps us awake at night, I think, it was identified by the Strategic Posture Commission. Heck, it was identified by the, uh, the Trump Nuclear Posture Review as well. What kept us awake at night, quite frankly, was the advantage in, in, in theater nuclear forces that Russia had at the time. Right. So, uh, we said at the unclassified level they have about 2,000 nuclear weapons. We, we probably deploy about a tenth of that, right? And it's not just the numbers. It's the types of weapons, right? It's land-based, sea-based, air-delivered. It's um, things like surface-to-surface uh, -surface missiles. It's cruise missiles. It's nuclear depth chargers. It's nuclear torpedoes. A lot of stuff going on, and NATO did not have uh, similar options with, with which to, to respond. And so the question is, was there, was there, um, was there a potential for Russia to misperceive our commitment, our resolve to use nuclear weapons in a, in a European scenario, right? And so we resolved that in, in order to disabuse them of any such notion, we were going to deploy the nuclear sea launch cruise missile, all right? So f fast forward to today, I think that's a similar problem that, uh, that, that, we, uh, that we experience now. 
but it's not only Russia, it's also the growth of regional nuclear capabilities by China. According to uh, the former STRATCOM commander, when he testified uh, a year or two ago, China has about 900 uh, dual capable uh, theater range missiles, short, medium, intermediate range missiles, uh, uh, ballistic missiles as well as cruise missiles that can be nuclear capable. And uh, I think you all know how many we have in the region, which is, which is, which is zero at this point. That doesn't mean that you, you can't introduce weapons into there, but, but now you have a situation where not only uh, does Russia enjoy nuclear superiority at the regional level, but China does at, uh, uh, in its region. And so the question is, is what do we need to do about it? And, and here it might be uh, a good opportunity to talk about wh where, where the sides stand in, the, in, this, in this respect. The, uh, the Biden administration, they understand this problem. They understand the need to de deter limited nuclear strikes. I think they agree with, uh, with that. But where, where, there, where we may disagree is on how many additional options are needed to do that. Okay? So when the, uh, the Biden administration writes its, uh, its uh, <clears throat> statement to Congress opposing the nuclear sea launch cruise missile, it says that uh, they believe the U.S. has, quote, sufficient current and planned capabilities for deterring an adversary's limited use. And they're talking about the, the low-yield submarine launch ballistic missile warhead, the uh, air launch cruise missile delivered from bombers, the dual-capable aircraft, the fighter aircraft that can deliver um, uh, the B-61 bomb. So their assumption is that we have enough options to do that, right? It's just a matter of getting them to the Indo-Pacific in time to, to, to have that effect. Others believe that, well, we don't really have enough options, at least compared to what Russia and China are deploying in their respective areas, right? We don't know for sure whether the numbers that we have are sufficient. They were barely sufficient, if at all, against Russia. And now you have the Chinese threat. Are you planning to move weapons from, from, from Europe uh, over to the Indo-Pacific, if, if that's the case? Probably not. So the, 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 the point is that we probably need something more. I think this was a, uh, a recommendation from the Strategic Posture Commission. I think it's, it's recommended by the, uh, the, the Project Adam uh, uh, study group summary that while the current capabilities and, 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 wep and weapons are, are necessary, they're not sufficient. Something more is needed, something more. And here's, and here's where the big debate occurs is, is how much more do we need, okay? And this is what we gotta figure out. We've been analyzing this issue now for two years, at least, since uh, Admiral Richard at Stratcom and says, you know, we need, we need uh, academics, we need think tanks to start thinking about this. And so we have a number of options out there. And so finally, I think it's time to put the pencils down and, and, and decide on, on, on what you're going to do. And this is where you, you move from the realm of strategy, I think, into the realm of politics, okay? All, all the, the solution sets are out there. You just have to decide within this administration and taking into account the way Congress views these issues, what are you going to do moving forward? Now, admittedly, the administration has probably had a lot on their mind, and they've been uh, uh, unable, uh, or maybe they are thinking about what comes next after the nuclear post review. Um, and I think perhaps that the recent announcement that the administration wants to, um, to, to go forward with a new variant of the B-61 bomb, it's called the B-61-13, which is designed to go after harder targets than the, the, the current B-61, uh, is an indication that they, they have been thinking about this. And uh, the administration does understand the need for additional options, right, to enhance the credibility of the U.S. nuclear deterrent. The question is how much? Why, why the B-61-13, but not the slicker men, right? So, uh, and we can, we can have a, a discussion about it, but I think the, the center of gravity of this debate is moving in the direction of we need more options, all right? So now, what's, what's causing angst in this, in this debate is the, the lack of certainty about what those options are, right? So you have the, uh, 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 the, the I, I'm gonna be criticized for these terms, but sort of you have the pro-nuclear, the strong deterrence advocates saying we need, we need more, and w whether it's Frank or Greg or others, it, we, we all sort of use the phrase mo modest additions. It's, it's, you know, as, as Frank says, we don't need enough to make the rebel bounce. No one's talking about combined strength of Russia and China. Okay, it's, uh, it's maybe the nuclear sea launch cruise missile, you know, a few hundred of those. It's preparing to upload some of our ICBMs and SLBMs, and maybe that's in the, in the hundreds as well. It's not a, a few thousand additional nuclear weapons, right? So there is, there is a, um, there, there is a, um, 
a, a number of additional capabilities that, that need to be identified, but, but it, it can be modest. On the other hand, you have the, the arms control community that's really afraid that uh, if, if we do uh, agree that we need more capabilities to address China, that this is going to be the start of a major arms race. Okay? So how do you square these two fears together? Right? And so I would suggest that there may be a grand compromise in the offing, and it's something that um, uh, you know, Pro Project Adam laid out sort of the range of views, but it wasn't in their remit necessarily to, to come up with a, uh, a final grand design, although I think your 10 principles do a really good job of laying out the, 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 the general outlines of, of a compromise. So here's the compromise, and, and I'd love to hear your views about this, and that is, again, we need some additional capability. And so we need to, we need to raise the, the, the limits uh, under the New Star Treaty, which are about to expire, in February of 26. Right now the limits are 1550. What if you were to go to 2500 or 3000, right? And <clears throat> this would not just be a limit on strategic forces, but now you would limit all nuclear weapons. Russian tactical nuclear weapons, those 2000 that I spoke about, you, uh, and you would limit the strategic forces. So now you've gone from 1550 to, I don't know what the number is. Again, we, we need the administration to tell us what, what that number needs to be. It's more than what we have today, but, but let's say it's 2,200. And I use 2,200 because that was the, uh, the figure in the previous arms control treaty, right? The, uh, uh, the Moscow treaty. So let's say we go to 2,200, you cover all nuclear weapons, you, um, <clears throat> you uh, uh, go forward with a nuclear sea launch cruise missile, and you prepare to upload uh, our ICBMs and our SLBMs, prepare to reconvert some of our bombers. The arms control community, uh, they're not going to like the fact that we're we're going from 1550 up to 2200 or whatever that number is. But what they do get in return is they get restraints. They get restraints. You, haven't, you, you no longer have an unlimited nuclear arms race. Russia and the United States have agreed to what they need to deal with the expansion of China and no more. All right? And, uh, and so now you have uh, the framework for a grand compromise. You have the nuclear modernization that's necessary to deal with the expansion of China, but yet you have the uh, continuing uh, limits uh, to, to avoid a nuclear arms race. Right? So uh, I'm going to stop there and we'll open it up to questions. Thank you. Well, terrific. Thank you so much for um, setting the, the table with such a provocative and, and uh, well, clock for week and comments. Um, so you guys know, you're clicking on the thing you do, the QR code, you're, you're sending your questions into the magic thing, and then it spits out the question cards for me. We've already got four, so let's just dive straight in. Um, what are the perceptions from allies and adversaries on U.S. triad modernization? Do allies believe that it's enough? Are allies cautious of it? Do you, Elaine, do you want to start with that? Uh, well, you know, I think I, I don't, I haven't heard any ally government that has said you shouldn't do the triad modernization. We brief them on it all the time. Mm -hmm. We, we, when I was in and yeah. now I'm sure, I'm sure that those who are in now do that. Um, and, you know, it's been, it's been, it, it, they've been supportive of it. Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't heard any, oh my God. Don't do that. Um, mm -hmm. they, they do sometimes say, how do we respond to our public or our experts who say uh, this will right. cause an arms race or this will, and so we, you know, we talk about that kind of thing, but it's not, I, I think allies are supportive of the modernization program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. And um, in fact, you, you know that probably one of the last issues that the Biden administration had to adjudicate on, on their nuclear posture review was whether to uh, include the language, the, the no first use language, mm -hmm. right? It was mm -hmm. a big deal. And, and I think it's generally recognized that the reason that they did not include that language is because of what they heard from the allies. Yeah. Right? They need to, to assure the allies. So if they were, allies were concerned about that, uh, it's, it's a logical assumption um, to conclude that, that they did support uh, the U.S. Uh, nuclear modernization program. But then the question is, do they find it sufficient? Mm -hmm. or, or do they need, to, do they need more? And, mm -hmm. and again, you've, you've heard anecdotally, and, and I can say based on my experience, when we spoke to the Allies about things like uh, the nuclear sea launch cruise missile, um, they, they, um, uh, we know that uh, General Trilton, for instance, m mentioned in one of his articles that the, the Allies had concerns when we retired the, the predecessor to that, the nuclear Tomahawk land attack missile. So they're paying very close attention. And again, I think that, that um, the, the way you reassure the Allies is, look, there's two ways. You can, you can tell them that we're going to be there, that we have a nuclear umbrella, right? Mm -hmm. You can say it, 
But if you really want to reassure them, you have to show it. And the way you show it is by deploying new capabilities. We have not deployed, we, we, we withdrew most of our tactical nuclear weapons, our regional nuclear weapons, uh, in 1990, 1991. Okay, we kept the, the B-61 bombs in Europe. We haven't done anything since then as Russia expands its regional capabilities, as China expands its regional capabilities, allies are looking at you. There's got to be some response. And it, it, again, as, as Greg points out, it's not a weapon for weapon response. But there has to be a response. If we don't take measures uh, to respond to these threats, I wonder if the allies are thinking, what level of commitment do you really have to spite what you're telling us? Uh, changing gears a little bit, um, how important is homeland missile defense for assuring allies? Does missile defense need to be strengthened? Maybe, first. maybe I'll start with that one. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think that at the heart of, of allied concern over the U.S. nuclear umbrella is the concern that the United States is vulnerable to, 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 to nuclear counterattack. Right? It's our vulnerability that creates uh, any weakening in, in their perception of the U.S. extended return, right? So they're afraid that as North Korea builds its ICBMs and they're able to uh, attack the United States, that South, some South Koreans are wondering, would the United States really use nuclear weapons on their behalf if this meant that uh, you know, N North Korea would, would wreck the, the destruction on, on San Francisco or Los Angeles, right? It's that vulnerability that weakens extended deterrence and assurance. And so if we can reduce that vulnerability through missile defenses, right, if we can stay ahead of the North Korean threat, if we convince North Korea that any attack against the United States would not only be uh, futile because we'd intercept most of their missiles, but it would also be fatal because then we would respond and eliminate their regime, right? So in this sense, I think missile defense, by closing a vulnerability, contributes to a reassurance of allies. Uh, yeah, I was, a couple of anecdotes. Um, so I did hear uh, often from uh, both, both Northeast Asian allies, Japan and South Korea, that they worried about when North Korea gets an ICBM that can reach the U.S., that will fundamentally change extended nuclear deterrence because you'll be vulnerable. Right. And it's like, okay, well, two things. Mm -hmm. One, um, we were way more vulnerable all during the Cold War to a lot more Soviet nuclear weapons uh, than North Korea will ever have. Uh, and we still were very strong about extending nuclear deterrence to NATO. Um, two, we are doing everything. So don't, don't worry that we will be uh, coerced and bullied out of E&D mm -hmm. uh, was the message there. But also, we, you know, we did consciously take them to uh, missile defense sites, to, to Vandenberg. It was easier to get to than Alaska. Uh, and say, OK, see these, these interceptors? We're trying our best to be sure that we are not so vulnerable to North Korea. We're trying to stay ahead of North Korea. Um, and even if we can't, extended nuclear deterrence will continue. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it is important for it. Um, you know, you don't want to say to allies where we don't have a total, uh, for, for North Korea, we can try to stay ahead of them. For Russia and China, trying to defend against all of their forces, at least for now, is we technologically, we just can't do it. Um, so we don't want to undermine allies who worry about Russia and China and say, well, we can't defend against everything they have. Therefore, you should worry about extended nuclear deterrence. So again, you have to be careful what argument you make for one. You know, mm -hmm. South Korea, very much worried about North Korea. Japan, second worry under China, um, that it doesn't undermine you and your arguments you make to allies someplace else about a different adversary. Can I, can I follow up on that really quickly? Because both of you have the government experience at, at senior levels. And how, if getting the Gloves. government to speak with one voice sometimes is quite challenging. <laughs> getting the interagency, the right hand and the left hand often don't talk. How, how do you imagine we can improve those sorts of cultural or organizational processes within 
our defense establishments to be able to communicate these strategies effectively to allies. Can I take that one first? Yes. Because um, having, as you did, as Brad Roberts, having the uh, privilege of mm -hmm. co-chairing with uh, allies some of the extended deterrence dialogues mm -hmm. with Japan, South Korea, and then in NATO in the high-level group. Um, it, certainly for the, the ones that were beginning mm -hmm. in Japan and South Korea that, that both began in 2010, mm -hmm. those deterrence dialogues um, were, and I felt strongly about keeping them, defense and state, mm -hmm. defense including uh, the relevant military, always a joint staff, STRATCOM, USFK if it was there, USFJ if it was in Japan, but having the defense folks and the state people mm -hmm. all in the room together, mm -hmm. talking with them. Um, again, do Americans always talk with one voice? No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and sometimes you can play that to our advantage. You go, mm -hmm. okay, let's let you hear the range of views on this U.S. delegation. Let's mm -hmm. let you hear it. Yeah. You're a mature ally. It's not, don't you worry your pretty little head about it, we're gonna take care of it for you. You need to understand how complicated deterrence calculations and all that, you need to know how that, that goes. Mm -hmm. You need to hear this range of views and we need to talk about it as a US team with a South Korean or Japanese team that is both Ministry of Defense and, and Foreign Ministry Mm -hmm. Sometimes you can prod allies to do more interagency coordination as well. So just making our institutions such that they bring in more than just DOD mm -hmm. is one way to do that. Interesting. Look, I think, I think we have all the official documents, uh, all the information's out there. We communicate you know, at the end of a nuclear posture review. We make speeches. We have the informal consultations. Allies know what our position is. Yeah. And most administrations do speak with one voice, right? But there's a lot of noise out there. You hear from Congress, you hear from think tanks, you hear from academics. That, that's what complicates the debate for the allies. Mm -hmm. But I, I think most administrations do a good job consulting prior to and uh, uh, after the event. Getting better and better, let's put it that <laughs> way. We haven't always been, but yeah. Um, so in the age of hypersonics, there's an assumption here in this question. I'm interested in your, your, your thoughts on the assumption, too. In the age of hypersonics, NATO gravity bombs are entirely symbolic. Is it time for a new, more responsive, and survivable NATO capability? Uh, can I start with hypersonics? Um, <laughs> hypersonics. Oh, my God, there's no time. They're, they're, they, we won't know where they're going. Okay. Uh, Ballistic missiles are faster than any hypersonics I know of. Cruise missiles, you don't know where they're going. Mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe if, depending on the type of hypersonic, um, you may not have as much time as you would for a cruise missile, and you may not know as much about where it's headed as for a ballistic missile. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it kind of combines those two characteristics that we faced for a long time. Um, <sighs> ballistic missiles, the time scale for ballistic missiles is very short. We've been dealing with this for a long time. So what is it that you think is so new and different about hypersonics? That, that's, that's, that's number one. Uh, number two, um, it's not hypersonics that makes me think that we should um, be assessing, reassessing, as NATO is. What is it we can do to improve survivability, to, to improve flexibility of, uh, of NATO um, deployments, uh, dual capable aircraft, uh, gravity bombs that are new and improved, but basically the same, um, same capability overall. Um, what can we do to improve on that, which is why I threw down the Gee, I'd love to see something that allies could have a direct involvement in, mm -hmm. um, even with, with the veto, even in a veto role, because um, uh, we're not going to hand over mm -hmm. authority to somebody else to use U.S. nuclear weapons. That's presidential. Yeah, we explain that a lot to allies. Um, so how can they take on more of a role and responsibility improve their stakes, I'd love to see what that capability is. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, Elaine is right that it's just not a matter of hypersonics. Right? Currently, NATO's uh, dual-capable aircraft may or may not be vulnerable, depending on you know uh, whether they can disperse them to more survivable locations uh, during the crisis. Uh, they will have problems uh, penetrating uh, enemy air defenses. But again, the solution is you, you need another option. You need another option. And you need an option that is not vulnerable to hypersonics and is always there and can be used promptly. And I'm sorry, but that's the nuclear sea launch cruise missile. Right? You don't even have to ask the allies to base it on their territory. This, this, this weapon system is, is made to order. Right? It, in fact, when we proposed it, we knew that it wouldn't even affect arms control because it's not limited by the New START Treaty. So it's not an issue of hypersonics. It's, it's an issue of making uh, NATO uh, nuclear forces more survivable and giving the president and NATO an additional what, option. Um, this one's for Rob. Um, how does the United States respond to Russia and China's regional nuclear superiority without initiating an arms race? Well, I think somebody already responded to that. They, yeah. They've already started the race. They have 2,000 non-strategic nuclear weapons in Europe. We have some really small number of that. You know, it's a classified number, but you, you know, Hans Christensen can tell you from the Federation of American Scientists how many we have. Right? Um, <laughs> what, what arms race are you, are you talking about? The, the Russians do not need to respond. If we were to deploy 300, 400 nuclear sea launch cruise missiles, right? It's, it's not going to impact their 2,000 weapons, except in this sense. Now they know. Now they know that if they were to use any of those weapons against us, we would have another means to respond. Right? The, the role of the slick command is not about holding specific targets at risk. You can do that potentially with, with an LRSO off a bomber. You could do that potentially with a, a penetrating B-21. But it's about raising the level of risk to the adversary so that when they engage in a conventional war that could escalate to a nuclear war, we have another option with which to respond. An option that they cannot take out because it's, it's survivable. It's an option they don't have to worry that we have to bring from the continent of the United States because it's already plying their waters. That's the whole purpose of it. Now, I was going to say, I think that the, the Slickman argument um, is one that I think from a deterrence perspective, I had to say this at a congressional hearing, because I'd been kind of a skeptic of, of, you know, prove to me we need a Slickman. Why, and, and all the offsets, all that. So at that hearing, I was kind of forced to say, no, I think for deterrence purposes, um, there's an advantage to having us look them in for the very reasons that we've heard already. Um, but I wouldn't pin it on the allies. Hmm. I wouldn't pin it on the allies. But let me ask you in a different <laughs> way to, to whoever asked the question. What if I could get an agreement with Russia to go to, let's say, I 2,200 or, or 2,500 nuclear weapons, which covers all of our tactical nuclear weapons. Would you then give me the slick amend? Would you then allow us to deploy uh, tactical nuclear weapons, knowing that it's not going to start an arms race? Because you've limited them up front, right? So that, that might be the, the possible solution. Um, this one's to Elaine. Um, if there is no single weapon system capable of assuring all of our allies, what approach should the US government take to assure as many allies as possible. Flexibility. Um, why do we have a triad? It's not because each one, anybody here who has done any study, why do we have a triad and what are its advantages and disadvantages? Each leg has a different advantage and disadvantage, right? Um, so why do we think in the theater one, one capability is going to do everything? It's not. Um, and, I, you know, uh, I'm going to take the Strategic Posture Commission uh, view and say, I'm going to tell you about characteristics, not specific systems. Mm -hmm. I, mm, mm, eh. mm -hmm. Propose some systems, uh, you know. Mm. Mm. Oh, that actually dovetails really nicely into this next question. How do allies and partners see the results of the 2023 Strategic Posture Commission? <sighs> what, what are you hearing? What's the buzz on the um, proverbial allied streets? <laughs> Uh, what's well, been out three weeks now? Is that right? Yeah, about three weeks. I have been in Korea. I have been in, you know, with allies in Seattle. Um, I haven't heard a lot. I haven't heard anything. So, more to follow. You know, of, of the of of the issues that it covered in great depth, mm -hmm. that section is succinct and not 
real sp I mean, so it, it doesn't go into as much detail in that aspect of the Strategic Posture Commission, in my view, as some of the other aspects. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking at Frank and Greg and, and Leonore and, and asking, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, there, there, for, for the audience online, there's, there's head nodding over here in the audience. Um, there's audience online? What? Oh, the you. technology. Yeah. <laughs> um, should U.S. missile defense focus purely on the threat from the DPRK or also on threats from Russia and China? May, may I? Yeah. yeah. Yep. So the strategic, the strategic Posture Commission has actually opined on this. And uh, they are concerned about uh, uh, limited Russian-Chinese strikes against the U.S. homeland for the purpose of coercing us. This is something that the U.S. Northern Command, uh, Commander Van Herc, has talked about, the threats to U.S. critical infrastructure, right? So the, the theory is that uh, in order to, um, uh, to keep us from reinforcing our allies during, during a conflict, um, you can uh, launch strikes, whether they're conventional missile strikes or nuclear strikes, uh, to, to break our will, to keep us from actually coming to the aid of our allies. And so some limited missile defense in this scenario, right, to be able to take out uh, that, that, that cheap shot, if you will, those limited numbers, could enhance deterrence because now you're taking away uh, a potential Russian or Chinese theory of victory. You know, I, can't, I can't get away, I can't intimidate the U.S. out of this. I'm going to have to launch a major attack, and that has a whole host of different implications. We're more likely to respond to a major attack, right? So I think I, I, I very much like the idea of the Posture Commission asking us to look at this, but there's one other angle to this as well, and that is in a two nuclear peer environment, if you, uh, if you are concerned about the survivability of U.S. nuclear forces, that is, you know, you have to, in the, in the worst case scenario, you're fighting a nuclear war, a, a, a large scale nuclear war against Russia and a large-scale nuclear war against China. You have to make sure that against any combination of aggressors, against any kind of attack, you have survivable nuclear forces and that you can retaliate, right? That, that your nuclear command and control can communicate with, you know, this is after nuclear war has occurred. So, to the extent that you can improve the survivability of U.S. nuclear forces and U.S. nuclear command and control with missile defense, again, this is not Astrodome defense, this is not protecting the U.S. population, this is preferential defense for your ICBM fields or your bomber bases, right, or your nuclear command and control. Preferential defense, limited numbers, you can actually enhance deterrence against uh, uh, the worst possible uh, uh, attack imagine, which is a combined Russian and Chinese attack. Mm -hmm. And I think the nuclear command and control is the most important, okay, mm -hmm. of those things to protect. But, and that was certainly a concern. The first hypersonics, well, actually, it was, it was the first I remember, because I was still at NDU, um, it was, oh my god, cruise missiles off our coast could mm. do an unwarned attack against Washington. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so that was, that was a concern that, goes, that predates even hypersonics. I remember the objective of these kinds of defenses are not to protect the country per se, but to enhance deterrence, right? To create uncertainty in the mind of the attacker, whether it's Russia or China, whether it's a limited attack or a large scale attack. If they don't know how many of their missiles are gonna get through the missile defense, defense, mm -hmm. then, then they have less of an incentive to, to attack in the first place. Um, we are, we're running short on time, so if anybody has any last minute questions, you know, send them into the, the QR thing or do, and um, we'll try to get, make sure they're, they're raising the last round. Um, how can we effectively demonstrate to our non-nuclear allies that we genuinely prioritize their security? I mean, this is the, 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 the billion dollar question of extended deterrence, uh, but very curious as to your thoughts on um, 40 years like. and I never found the answer to that question <laughs> trying to do this. John Woodward, it, you know, dealt with the allies back in the 70s and 80s uh, on, on, gee, would we really, and the mm -hmm. whole INF, yeah arms control, deployments, um, but that was, allies asked for that. So it's the, it's the discussion, the real discussion, not fly in and give a briefing, not here let us tell you what we're gonna do, the real discussion with allies about what do you think is needed? What, how do you see deterrence of your adversary that you may have different views about 
what they value and how they react and do you go strong and hard first or do you pull back because we're worried about escalation. You know, they may have ideas about that. They may have ideas about what kind of capabilities they would like to see. And a lot of times we, as I've written about, sometimes we just go in and lead the witness. Yeah. <laughs> Leading the witness, wouldn't it be good if we did th this thing that we already think we ought to do? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. That's not a real conversation. Right. Um, and they do have good analysts and good strategists. And so it's, a, it's not a, you just tell us what you want us to do, because that's not productive either. Mm -hmm. um, so I do get back to it's the relationship, not the stuff. Mm -hmm. It's the having real dialogues where we, we may agree or disagree, we, we battle it out, we come to some view, and that's how we go forward as an alliance. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's a constant. I do have to remind some allies that, gee, we deploy 30,000, 32,000, whatever, uh, conventional forces in your country, and mm -hmm. that really is, um, if that's not the wedding band, it's at least the engagement ring, yeah. right? <laughs> Very well put. Yes, no, Americans are on the line. When Americans yeah. are on the line, that, yeah. that, that's a real commitment. Yeah. It, I agree with Elaine. You have to remind the allies, uh, uh, you know, what, what, what we've done to, to 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 ensure that commitment. But I remember uh, Jen Stoltenberg, the uh, the uh, Secretary General of NATO, said this is probably about four or five years ago. He says, and this is probably more in the context of you know the, the Russian invasion and the threat uh, mm -hmm. invasion of Ukraine and the threat to NATO. He says deterrence starts with resolve. You can't just feel it; you have to show it. Yeah. And for me, you have to show it, and the way you show it is by adding additional capabilities to tell our allies that we see what Russia is doing, we see what China is doing. It's been 30 years since we eliminated all of our, or most of our nuclear weapons from your regions. Now it's time to reintroduce some of those. I think that is a, an appropriate note to end our conversation on. Thank you so much for your time and your thoughts on these critical questions that, you know, are, are, are perennial, right? We have to keep revisiting them. We have to yeah. keep challenging ourselves. We have to keep challenging our assumptions, and we have to continue to do so hand in hand with our partners and, and, and treating them with, with the kinds of agency and um, empathy that, that real strategic dialogues require. So mm -hmm. thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us, and I'm going to invite the group to lunch now. Um, thank you so much to the Pony team for organizing this incredible event and this incredible analytic project, um, Heather, Lachlan, and others. This has um, been a, a very interesting and intellectually stimulating day. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm.